Okay, made it to a Friday. How are we living out there? Hope everybody is having a fantastic start to their day. I know we are, Lucas and myself. We're here with you until 1 o'clock. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in. We're looking forward to having a bunch of cool people hang out with us today. I don't think we've ever had Javon Curse on the show. But the freak is going to be here in about 15 minutes and... We'll talk to him about the Titans and some cool work that he's doing in the community. So is Emily Proud. She's going to be here pretty early on, too. Bowl season, bud. Yes. You're excited? Yes. You're like a drug addict back there. Football. 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 It's so convenient that when you need audio, you have it. And that when I need audio, it's nowhere to be found. <laughs> or you're talking to Robert about God knows what. Very convenient. Yes, bowl season, kids. We're back at it, and I know people are excited. We got SEC stat of the day for uh for you as well. Half an hour away from the hometown lenders Bahamas Bowl. <laughs> Between Miami, Ohio, and UAB. Is that what you're going to throw up on my screen in yes. here instead of this lovely scenic fireplace? It, Although, I honestly, I do love the... It, it's, it's calming. It's very calming. Yeah. Which I don't know if it's good for me. Like, we have, so, the new studio, for those of you listening on FM radio, uh, audio or visual bit on an audio medium, there's a, there's a monitor in here, a giant monitor in here, that they can put sports on if they want to because they're still putting the TVs and whatnot. And they just have like a, you know, the backdrop of a, of a constantly running fireplace. And it's very, it's very soothing, which I feel like is necessary the last couple of weeks because it's been a little bit of seasonal depression. But the vibes are high today, and we're looking forward to a good conversation with you guys. Um, so let's start with some good news if you're a Titans fan. Danico Autry is practicing for the second day in a row yesterday. Now, I don't know if that means that he's very much on track to play against the Chargers, but it is an overwhelmingly positive sign for a dude that they really, really need this week. The Chargers' offensive line is not good without Rashawn Slater. Like, they've just been they been underperforming all year long. You've heard people talk about it. There's been injuries. Of course, every team has them. But anything, anything that you can do to disrupt that quarterback – on Sunday when they travel out to L.A. is going to be critical. So looking at looking at the implications of that and a couple of un- other injury notes that uh, I think are important specifically about this team, the thing that is not trending positively for at least this week is Traylon Burks and how big of an impact that has on a team that doesn't really have a true number one wide receiving option without Robert Woods back at practice yesterday, dealing with an illness uh, on Wednesday, but said he felt fine. I think John Glennon asked him if he had an AJ Brown burrito or something like that. You remember it was like a two week stretch. I he's like having to play on an IV because <laughs> what happened to him? Chipotle catching more strays. Yeah. Well, listen, it's, it's better. At least, at least that was done unintentionally instead of you taking out random uh, random businesses that may potentially want to be a part of the wonderful radio program that we do around here. Like what? Name Anytime, time, Subway. Come on with it. Come on. I don't care that Lucas doesn't like the way he smells after he goes to Subway. It's okay. Wait, wait when was this established? You did this a couple of weeks ago. That, that, it's very uncomfortable. I never said that. Us. Yeah. I mean, You're just true. making things up. No, it's like you're trying to make, make the helmet catch happen. Or what did you do yesterday? The Windy City? Los Angeles? The Windy City. He's just a weirdo, man. Anyway, <laughs> Burks is uh, not trending positively. No practice for him yet this week. Dealing with a concussion, and I think people, uh, I think people get a little antsy about the concussion stuff. And this is the kind, this is the exact kind of thing that they're trying to avoid, right? Don't set expectations for yourself for dudes with concussions. You have no idea how long it's going to take them to come back. So I'm glad that at least that – I'm, I'm not happy that the Tua thing happened, obviously, but there does seem to be an even more increased emphasis on protecting these dudes from getting their brains scrambled on a regular play, and that's exactly what happened to Traylon Burke. So as long as he needs, give it to him. But in the meantime, from a football standpoint, they could really use that guy or somebody like him. 
I uh, I've been I've been trying to figure out what it is about the Titans if it's just the offensive line that's keeping them from making just a couple of plays a game, just a few enough. Now the defensive stuff is a real problem because I do think they make a couple of plays a game, but they get undone, or at least lately it's been by turnovers. And then obviously the inability to get pressure. What did we say? Four sacks in the last four games? That's right. Four yeah. sacks. Four in the sacks, last four no games. turnovers in the last four. And Danico hasn't played since the first half of Green Bay, really. So there's a direct correlation with that. I uh, Are you talking about the offensive line not making any plays? No, I'm talking about the the ability of the Titans offense to make some plays. Just generally make some plays down the field. Now they're getting some of those. Like, Chig is making some plays. Austin Hooper is making some plays. Derek, you know, uh, makes a play and then has been a little fumble prone lately. I, I I don't know what the correlation is. The hit the hits that it gets popped out on, he's getting smoked. So, you know, it would take a superhuman effort. But you really, really need that in a big spot. And they've got to find ways to be better about taking care of the football. He cannot be responsible for half of their turnovers the way that he was last Sunday. So... Because I'm watching, I'm watching things like the 49ers, right? And they they're literally out there with Mister Irrelevant, the the final pick in the NFL draft, Brock Birdie, and he's hurt, and he's out there. I mean, they they are scheming guys open in ways that allow Brock Purdy to look just as good and just as able in that offense as Jimmy Garoppolo. Now, a lot of times those guys fizzle out a little bit. These backup quarterbacks that Kyle Shanahan just kind of works some offensive magic and all of a sudden Nick Mullins is out here balling on a Thursday night. By the way, who is their backup? Backup, backup. Oh, right now. Backup, a, backup, backup, backup. Excellent question. I don't know the answer to that question. Did they, did they talk about it on the broadcast? I just kind of had it on in the background, but I watched Brock Purdy Cause he, in particular because that's the kind of thing that's driving me crazy. I'm watching Taylor Heineke like have – at least two drives a game where he just plays blackout football. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. And he I like his wide receivers a lot. Like Terry McLaurin, they have they 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 do have something that the Titans do not right now, which is not a great offensive line, but still playmakers in the uh, in the passing game. So like I'm trying to figure out why the hell can't these guys do that? What is it? Can it be really this difficult? Is it as hard as they're making it look? And I think it comes back to that philosophical stuff. Oh, they signed Josh Johnson. That's right. It was a whole thing because Josh Johnson got signed before Baker. Yeah, and and Purdy, you know, is not totally healthy. I mean, he he was no. That's what I'm saying. He was playing hurt last he had night. A rib injury. He was really efficient last night. That again. Thank you for listening to the show. Oh, did you say that? I did. <laughs> just, just reiterating. Wait, it. wait you, we had such a good day yesterday, and and you, we're gonna come out of the gate like this. I feel I feel like we gotta I feel like we gotta we gotta bring it up a little. I'm busy back here. Okay, thank you. So happy to hear that. 615-737-1045. Charlie. Oh, is it our guy, Charlie and Franklin? Is it the Charlie and Franklin? Oh, it's been too long. What's up, Charlie? Well, um, I I don't want to – sometimes I want to call, but I don't want to interrupt what your flow is, so I I hang up. But anyway, this is is from the left field. I just got my second knee replaced a few months ago, and – Talking to the doctor a couple of weeks ago, he said, I don't have any ACLs in my knee. And I, it's a more of a medical question, but is there an advantage? I mean, if somebody hurt their ACL, is there any way to, to maybe not to play without an ACL? I mean, the doctor gave me no restrictions from my, from, you know, when they did my operation. They didn't say I couldn't play football, although I'm 85 years old and probably <laughs> I do think that's won't. That's an important qualifier, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, is there a doctor that could explain to me how can how can I not how can I operate without having an ACL? And you know, it, it puts people the pros out of out of. I don't know. Is that a question? I don't. I, no, I, I mean, I, I, like, I understand. Thank you for the call, Charlie. It's good to hear from you, buddy. And I hope the everything's going well with the knee replacement surgery. Um, I, because this is a question that comes up every once in a while. Because isn't there a playoff game or like a really important game that Philip Rivers played in with a torn ACL? And and there, I mean, we're talking about we're talking about NFL athletes performing at a high level. So let's just use Lawan as example. Like he needs the kind of movement that the ACL. Uh, allows you to have to be able to do his job at a high level, right? If he doesn't, I mean, Taylor's out. 
They always out here on a liquor. You, you see, you see this thing yesterday. They're doing. They they have like their own bourbon now. This damn podcast, busting with the boys. I, apparently, they did. I I haven't heard it yet, and I I'm not because I don't want to, but because I haven't had time. I heard they did a really good interview with Delaney recently that I'd like to check out. But uh, yeah, Taylor's out here walking around yesterday doing like this like liquor store tour because they're out here slinging bourbon for the podcast, so he can walk around fine. But he can't play left tackle at a at a Pro Bowl level the way that he's accustomed to it's but you know i mean i get where charlie's coming from there was a tennessee right tackle uh in early butch jones year he was a, a walk-on uh ended up win- winning a scholarship i want to say his name was jacob gilliam that he played basically yeah jacob gilliam played basically an entire season uh with an acl injury at right tackle okay so like there's there are examples of things like that happening but obviously that's you know god knows what that's going to cause down the line, and there's a difference between having that happen at 24 than there is at 85. Yeah. Anyway, Javon Curse is going to join us coming up next. We'll also get into some bowl games with Emily Proud. Big football weekend. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
The Buck Rising Show is powered by Spring Hill Heating and Cooling. Visit springhillac.com. Indeed. Javon Kirst going to be here momentarily. So is Emily Proud of CBS and 24-7 Sports. She's doing a lot of cool things with their bowl game coverage and with National Signing Day coming up. How long is her show? Where, where are they flying her at this point? Uh, well, Lucas had to run to the phone to get Javon Kerr, so we'll we'll find out that information from Emily here in just a little bit. And obviously, a lot of Titans discussion to have. Uh, and uh, and Coach Mack, obviously, will join us at 1120. We'll get into the game itself between the Titans and the Chargers, which is really a, really a fascinating matchup. In the meantime... Let's talk to Javon Curse, man. I don't think we've ever had you on the show. We've, we've not been on the air that long, Javon, but like, I feel like this is an egregious mistake by us. So I feel like I should start this by apologizing to you. <laughs> well, I, I, I truly accept your apology and you know what? I think you was just save me for the right time. And I'm, I'm happy to be on no matter what, when I'm on. Absolutely. Well, we're grateful for you spending some time and you're doing it on behalf of the gear up Tennessee campaign, a statewide COVID-19 vaccine awareness and education campaign, urging yeah. residents to protect themselves and their families and to talk to their doctors to get the facts about vaccination. So like the, the lineup that they, that, has come together for this whole thing, Javon. It's it's uh-huh. outstanding. Like different generations of this franchise. What what's the most fun about getting together like that? Obviously, beyond the cause that you guys are working towards right now. Um, um, actually, when I got I got on board a, a few weeks back, and then um, I was getting all the information I needed, just trying to get info on everything, so I can give, so I can educate people that I can. And then when I found out who was going to be there, I didn't find out until right before the press conference. When I got there, I, I saw Warren Moon. I'm like, Warren Moon? I'm like, listen here. Um, I never want, I'm like, with all due respect, I never want to sack you like I want to sack most quarterbacks that I looked up to when I was, <laughs> when I was growing up. But just seeing him there, I'm like, wow. I'm like, I didn't know he was going to be here. And not just him, but then you got Chris Johnson. You got, you got Blaine Bishop. Um, I have Brad Hopkins. And then working with Al Smith as well. Um, that, I, I was really excited to just be there around those guys and to be working on the same project. Um, I think it's a it's a, a really good cause. It gives a chance to a, a chance for us to reunite and and to be part of the team again and, and, and helping and not just helping helping ourselves, but we we, we help in the state of Tennessee as well. Well, that, it's just it's cool to hear guys like you who have you know are are superstars in the league, Javon. Like, kind of still find it cool to to see Warren Moon. Like, that's I don't know that I think that's super relatable in ways that that sometimes people people forget about because you guys, I mean, you live such high profile lives, but still, every once in a while, you see one of the guys that you grew up watching. I'm trying to tell you, man, and then like when I saw him, because like I do remember bumping into him over the years and knowing that he's a, a former Oiler and I'm a I'm a former Titan, and then knowing that we just we we could have crossed paths, but then I would always see him and then to have a chance to work with him, I like I I, I try to pick guys like that, pick their brains because like this guy looks he looks like he can still play. People tell me the same thing, but. I'm in the gym four days a week, still doing cardio for 35 minutes and waits for like maybe 45, 40, 45, 50 minutes. But this guy just, he he looks healthy and just always, just always on, on top of his game. No, anyway. it's and honestly, it's like Javon, respectfully, like you make the rest of us feel like hell for, for how, <laughs> how good you both still look at this stage of your lives. But anyway, uh, at this point, at this point, um, you know, speaking of speaking of like upkeep and stuff like that, I mean, I, I know you pay attention from you're, you've got you're involved in a lot of projects, obviously, but I know you still pay attention to what the Titans got going on. And we're just talking about the yeah. just the rash of injuries around here, man, and, and how much guys play through to get through a season. I can't imagine some of the worst injuries that you played through or that you saw teammates play through throughout the course of a season. Like, is, is there any that comes to mind that were particularly like memorable? I mean, honestly, like the, the most memorable, um, like I would say guy that was playing through injuries, who was number nine that put on that Titan two tone blue with my big brother, Steve McNair. Yeah, like that year that he got co MVP with with Peyton. Um, that year right there was um, I forgot. Um, well, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what injury he had that season, but this guy couldn't practice through the week. He could barely even like walk through the week, and he could, he did not practice through the week. 
and some reason for some way he would show up game time and be out there running around like Superman. And I don't know what he was on or what they put in him, but um, it, it, like the the the, the feat that he went through because he was beat up that season. Um, Neil O'Donnell had to come in and play quite a bit for us, um, and then he was just he got to the point where he was back when Steve was back on the field. He was like literally wasn't practicing. Like he'll come out for walk through during the week and you know um, all our, our walk through sessions. But after that, he didn't practice at all physically. And then on Sundays, man, he got up there and ran around. And I have the ultimate respect for that dude right there. What, whatever he was on, they need to bottle that up and give something to all football players, like every single last one of them. Well, I mean, every every one of you is insane to do the job that you do. Like, it's just, it's crazy to watch the kind of stuff that you guys put yourself through. And, and to, you know, to, to your point about bottling that thing up, it's just such an intangible quality that to make even guys – in your sport where you're all going through similar things and have the risk of any kind of injury to look at certain players in even a greater respect because of that, you know, it, it's, it's something that, uh, it's something that obviously the, the, the dynamic around injuries right now, Javon, that just yeah. changed so much. Um, and true and, and true enough, like we all, we all get injured through the season. Like what you said earlier, like we all get beat up. Um, it's just a matter of when it happens through the season because we don't have enough time to let an uh, injury seriously heal. Like, you may look up and have an injury right before the bye week, which that'll give it some time there. But besides that, uh, I would say from week eight on through the rest of the season, and maybe even before that, but I would say from, from week eight through the rest of the season, like, everybody's playing through some type of injury. It's just a matter of, of, of yours nagging more than someone else's or if, you, or if you can afford to take some time off here or there with, a, with, a good, with, with somebody that's backing you up or backing them up or whatever. Titans legend Javon Curse is here with us on behalf of the NFL alumni and the Tennessee Department of Health, the Gear Up Tennessee campaign out here providing vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine awareness and education. Uh, th- so to do what this Titans team has done this year, Javon, and again going back to last year where it's just, I mean, it's literally record-setting rate of injury. And with the way that guys are out of the lineup now in, in you know, I mean, 10 years ago, even five years ago, it wasn't the, as heavily monitored or it didn't seem like guys missed as much time as they did now for one reason or another, to have that many parts missing and to still find ways to to lead a division and, and try and keep this thing competitive, what does that say to you about the way that they're able to operate at this point under Mike Vrabel? Um, that says a lot about the coaching right there. Um, the, 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 coaching is that the coaching provides the, the culture. If they got the culture, they're like, like I say, we've been talking about injuries this whole time. Guys are going to get injured. That's going to be part of the game, but it's just a matter of how you work through those injuries. And, you know, like they've been taking some rough ones the past three weeks, um, losing the losing the teams and literally making those quarterbacks um, quarter um, players of the week in their respective conferences and whatnot. But outside of, outside of, of, of that spectrum right there, it's just out – it's – just like if, if they got the culture right, like you just got to move past it. Like I say, like Steve would, hurt, would play, get hurt all the time. Um, Eddie would be hurt when I, back when I played. I would be hurt sometimes, whatever. But it's just a matter of bouncing back from that. And then you get to, and then you get a chance to let your number twos, your number threes, to have a chance to go out there and make a name for themselves. And then by the time this thing gets, you know, to the playoffs, because they still have a chance to get into the playoffs, even though they only have a two game lead over the Jaguars, they still gonna. I, I still, I'm, I'm certain that they're going to still represent the, represent the, what is it, the AFC South? Yeah, that's what yeah. it is nowadays. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're still going to represent the, the AFC South when it comes to the playoffs, but and then at that point, they should have all the moving parts back together. Hey, I saw Bullock, uh, Bullock on the sideline of the Houston game when you guys, I think it was part of the Titans Foundation, y'all flew down there with yeah. a couple of people who yeah. uh, were kind enough to donate some money to charity. Who had a better time that weekend, you or Bullock? You know what? I think I had a better time. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm just saying the, the group of guys that they were with were, were pretty cool, and one of the guys had just beat cancer. Awesome. So, yeah, so it, it was an awesome time just, just hanging with these guys. And, like, the, the way that thing came about was uh, literally Keith and I were just – we were just hanging out at the Titans charity auction, and before you know it, these um, guys were bidding on a flight to Houston. I'm like, um, I want to get on a private plane and go to Houston and see the Titans kick some butt, and it ended up happening. Absolutely. Javon Curse, Titans legend, kind enough to make some time 
uh, with us on behalf of the Gear Up Tennessee campaign. Uh, they're doing great work, the NFL alumni in the community, and this is just a part of it. Javon, thank you so much for for stopping by, man. It was good to chat, and we're, we're definitely going to have to bother you again, if you don't mind, at some point down the line. Always good. I'm on that phone call away, always trying to help people. I always trying to remind people to tighten up, but also gear up as well. There it is, Javon Curse. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Javon Curse with us on 104.5 The Zone. Always good to catch up with the freak. Uh, I don't know how to, I, I was going to make a joke there, but then I decided not to. Emily Proud of CBS Sports <laughs> It's here. Hi, Em. Hi. It's great to see you. It's good to see you too. I actually got to interview the freak um, before the Titans playoff game this past year, as we know how that went, but it oh, was really wait. great to talk to him. So that's a good the, transition. Was this the thing at 6th and Peabody? It was. Yeah. He is obviously a very large man. He's a giant human being. <laughs> I stood on a stool to talk to him, but... He was great. He asked me to, like, we were just dancing and interviewing. I mean, it was no, it he's like an a vibe. awesome, awesome guy. Yeah. And then the game happened. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> that's all right. We don't have to bring that up. What happened? So, he M is, is here. Uh, at you, I feel like this is the one moment that I haven't seen you on a screen of some sort. You feel like, I feel like the transfer portal coverage has been fantastic, but also exhaustive. Yeah. And you've got an eight-hour show for National Signing Day coming up. Did I, did I get that right? Yes. So, uh, a couple... Weeks ago, I guess now, when the transfer portal opened up, we had a transfer portal palooza, which was spectacular. Uh, it was like, it felt kind of like draft coverage, except it was all trades. So a lot of breaking news, a lot of great conversation. Um, the, the cool part about working for CBS Sports and 24-7 Sports is that we have that network of reporters all across the country. And so you got to kind of see what how the transfer portal was impacting each team individually. Um, but eight straight hours is like an actual marathon. I mean, I, I went so you're home like Scott, and like... you're Scott Hansen. You're red zone. It, it felt like that, except I did get bathroom breaks, which was nice. And we did break for <laughs> for lunch while we had the uh, Cover 3 podcast on. And so it was, it'll be a similar thing next week for signing day. Um, and as we learn now, like signing day, the early signing period is way more active than, you know, that old February date. So like... I mean, you're you're jumping into a bunch of different projects for CBS, and obviously, you know, doing really really well with it since you since you made the move. Like, what has what has what about the coverage this season has kind of in real time? You've had to change because you covered college football for for years at this point, but like, this is a whole new environment. This is basically free agency, and like yeah. we've done NFL free agency before. But this is, I mean, so many different parts and pieces. Dudes who go into the portal who may not even end up at some place. The, the, the name of the Western Kentucky running back, or uh, quarterback, Lucas, that came back. After Austin Reed? Spending yeah. some time in the portal. Like, those situations happening. Like, it's just, I, I imagine we've, we've made the always sunny reference to Charlie too many times, Pepe Silvia. But, like, it feels like you're just trying to connect a bunch of dots all at the same time and do it on a live a live broadcast. Yeah, it's a little chaotic and it's weird because, you know, for a lot of these shows and things that we do, people don't realize, but a lot of like studying goes into it. I mean, I've got flashcards and notebooks and all that sort of thing. Unlike our show. Um, yeah, no, you just show up and do it, right? Yeah. Literally. <laughs> no, there's a, literally, a lot of I got a lot of prep work. one yesterday. Lucas almost, almost, no, two days ago, almost shot me. <laughs> we made it. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit tougher to do, but you're a pro, so you can do that. Um, I actually have to, you know, study ahead of time because I don't know everything about everything, but it's, it's, terrifying because you're like literally anything can happen you you hear rumors and whispers and you kind of prepare for what you think is going to happen you really don't know but ultimately you have to know every single player on you know all 131 fbs teams like that's oh, yeah, that's unrealistic fan bases will eat you alive if yeah you if you, right. if, exactly and so that's why we lean so heavily on team site reporters and, and yeah. guys that like you've had on your show like a west rucker from go balls 24 7 we have multiple west ruckers in every single market all across the country and so it's it makes it a lot easier from that standpoint and that I don't have to be expected to know everything um, we can lean on those guys and we have those experts but ultimately yeah it's just anything could happen any player on any team what that means for their team what that means for teams that they could potentially go to that show was just guys hitting the portal yeah the bigger story now is where the heck do they where go they, where do they go <laughs> yeah well so okay so most interesting and it can it can be somebody who's already made a decision as to where they're going or or a name that's still out there, but most interesting, not necessarily the biggest name, but most interesting name in the portal so far to you? Well, there's a lot of quarterbacks. Yeah. Um, and so I'd say probably the number one quarterback in that group, which would be Grayson McCall coming from Coastal Carolina. Um, 
I think some people assume that maybe he might follow his head coach, Jamie Chadwell, to Liberty. Um, I'm also interested to see new destinations for guys like Devin Leary and Brennan Armstrong and, and some of those guys that had spectacular seasons in the ACC, like 30-plus touchdowns for both of them two years ago. Yeah. Last year, not so good, and so maybe a change of pace is something that could help. And so I, I, I think this year we had great examples of transfer quarterbacks thrive in, you know, we like to say the grass is not always greener necessarily, and those are really just the good examples. There's a lot of not as good examples, but taking from that how a transfer quarterback, how a transfer player can transform a team, we have so many great examples of that now. And sure. so to see that and what that could look like next year for some of these teams that are really close, just as we say in the NFL, like a quarterback away, there's a lot of teams that are like that. Now they can go grab that guy. They're available. At Emily underscore proud is where you can follow her. She's a pro, uh, CBS Sports legend. I saw oh in, the, uh, in the last time I was on the show, you called me a celebrity, and I proceeded to pick every single game wrong. I believe that you guys did. Had you there. actually go over? I I don't know. Did Probably. We, do we have that, that on record? That I mean, week was awful. That was that Georgia was a, beating was Tennessee, bad. LSU beating bad. Alabama, was it Mississippi State and Auburn going into overtime, like. I think you and I both had a had a rough. I think uh, everybody slate. did. Yeah, that was that was a tough one. Give me a break. Thanks for inviting me back on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think you would. Way to sell it, Em. <laughs> Way to sell it. Uh, so as far well, I I think that's like what you just mentioned there, just to kind of keep that same train of thought, and then we'll talk about the bowl games that are coming up this weekend. Um, and right now. Starting. Oh, oh. Right now. There's football on the television, kids. Yeah. Balls being teed up. Oh my God. Do it. Do it. Do it now. Quickly. Do it now. Are you sure? Do it. Do what? Football. Football. Oh. Football. 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 It just goes so long. That's the best part. Keep going. It's a chorus. A symphony. Football. Courtesy of the Dan LeBatard Show. <laughs> That's right. Who am I looking at? Miami of Ohio and UAB? Oh, baby. Bahamas Bowl. We're back. It's Go Blazers. very windy there. Go Blazers. Anyway, so, I mean, UAB, for example. Um, as far, no, Trent Dilfer went to UAB, right? Absolutely. Yes, sure. Trent Dilfer, uh, he's not coaching this game. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, just just by, by nature of UAB taking a gamble on somebody like Trent Dilfer, a name that is going to attract not just high school talent because of his mm -hmm. connections to Elite 11, but there are going to be people who he's worked with that have gone through the process, may not have necessarily worked out or play time or whatever, and they can turn UAB into something. Deion Sanders at Jackson State. like Great example. And now to Colorado. Uh, that, I mean, I'm bringing my luggage with me, and it's Louie, is one of the, <laughs> I wish that I was as funny as Deion Sanders and as quick as Deion Sanders. Oh, not so on, you know, the faces of the current Colorado players, oh though, when he said that, I kind of, I kind of felt bad for them a little bit. I mean, it's exciting for the guys that will stick around and will play, but you know, the ugly side of the transfer portal that not a lot of people talk about is that a lot of these coaches sit down and have conversations with their players and say, "You need to hit the portal." I'm sorry, man, and that's what it used to look like before we had this freedom with college athletes being able to, you know, do the one-time transfer and go wherever they want and, and kind of take back some of that control, but. Those conversations happen, and they're they're probably happening right now. Which is, oh, for sure. So no, great. when he met, when he demoralized them further by making yeah, they happened um, like with a TV camera in front of them, and everybody watched on Twitter. Not even that. Just to say, I'm bringing kids with me that are say it with me, smart. And then they said it back, tough. Say it back, and they just like repeated it in this droning, sad, sad voice. Anyway, it's going to be interesting to see that the <laughs> bowl games. Now that we are officially underway, so beyond you know beyond the final four, because we can we have plenty of time to talk about the final four. What is the most interesting bowl game to you? Put aside your Tennessee bias, and it may still be that game. It kinda, it's okay if it is. It kind of is, though. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of storylines in this game, and I, I think that's what makes it so interesting. Yes, it's, of course, the South Carolina ruined my college football playoff chances support group. Uh, no, both of these teams. That's what I'm saying. I mean, they both can kind of shake hands and reminisce about... <laughs> How tough it was to lose to South Carolina at the end of the year. And the orangest orange bowl it of all time. It is the orangiest time. orange bowl. I mean, it's it's in the name. It's perfect. Um, I'm still I don't know if that's like a football storyline. Anyway. What, what was the joke? We were naming things that were more orange than this year's orange bowl. Can you name anything that's more orange than a Tennessee Clemson orange bowl? I don't. I don't know. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. No, it's not. And then the, I I had like I had mine, and Lucas ruined it out the gate. Anyway, this is a way too long ago. 
long ago callback. Okay. Um, no, I'm excited too about the quarterbacks in this one because yeah. it feels like an audition for both of them almost. I think Cade Klubnik is going to be the quarterback moving forward, but if he comes out and just lays a massive egg, you could see Clemson potentially be, I don't know, Dabo doesn't love the transfer portal, but he seems to be more open to it. They could be a potential, you know, suitor for one of those quarterbacks that's available. Um, and so to see what Klubnik does, I know there's a lot of excitement about kind of the the Klubnik era. Uh, for Milton, it's 100% in audition, especially when you have Nico Imaliava coming in next year um, to see, you know, kind of how that dynamic is. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of storylines in that one, and that one's one I'm keeping my eye on. I am actually excited to see, um, can, or yeah, Kentucky, Iowa no. here. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I like Alabama, Kansas State, honestly, because oh. I think that Kansas State is super feisty, you, and you I just how don't that see. Sicko got back there when I you thought you were going to see a bowl. joke. No, clearly no, that's a not a joke for me, Em. I can't wait to watch the Iowa. How do I game. go from I'm excited about the quarterback dynamic in the orangiest Orange Bowl to who is playing quarterback and does it even matter? <laughs> Music City Bowl. No, I no, but I am excited about um, Kansas State and Alabama matchup because that one for me is all kind of a, the mental side of it. Is Alabama has been a college football playoff mainstay. Now they're not playing in that game. What do they What do they care about? Meanwhile, Kansas State plays with so much, you know, excitement and energy, and they oh, to beat killers. Alabama would be massive especially with everything that's going on in college football and with the big 12 and tcu playing for the college football playoff and you know they're the champions of, of the league the big 12 so i just like that dynamic of what each team is playing for uh, i haven't checked what's what's bama's opt-out situation pretty mild i haven't seen it's anything pretty... it's it's been quite there so we're, we'll find out more i think they actually practice for the first time today but like bryce young's not playing right He's yeah. not expected to. I don't we think don't he's know. made an announcement. He hasn't. No, they, okay. they're practicing today, and Maybe so we'll find out more. No, right. yeah, they've. That's what I'm saying. It's been pretty quiet, but there's yeah, time. I, I don't think anybody like really expects him or Will Anderson to play, but I don't think either have made an official announcement okay. on it. Yeah. At Emily underscore Proud, CBS Sports twenty four seven. You can catch their live streaming coverage. CBS Sports HQ. What What is the next eight hour endeavor that you're anchoring? Oh, so excited! Signing day. No. Oh. Next to or next Wednesday, geez, I don't even know when it is. Um, going down to Fort Lauderdale, which is the CBS Sports headquarters, and they have all sorts of studios and stuff there. And so oh, we've lovely got lovely place to be headquartered. Well, they also have an office in Stamford, Connecticut, oh. and New York City and Nashville. Okay. So they're all over the place. But yeah, the Fort Lauderdale office, good time to go to Fort Lauderdale in December. Sure. So uh, we're all headed down there, and I'll um, anchor eight straight hours of signing day coverage and. Uh, we've got, again, analysts all across the country. It feels like maybe day three draft coverage where you just have it on your computer all day long. So highly recommend that. So on the 24-7 Sports YouTube page, it'll be on all day long. Uh, when you see your team flash up, that's when you turn on the audio and you listen to it and you hear what we have to say about no, your you team and how the they're doing. Of the eight I mean, hours. I think you should, but, you know, I'm, I'm realistic about viewer habits. Again, um sell it him. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it, will, it will also be uh, occasionally on CBS Sports HQ uh, for a couple hours as well. And so there's lots of chances to see it and should be very exciting. I don't know if it's going to be as exciting as last year with uh, Deion Sanders pulled off with Travis Hunter. But now that Deion's in a power five job, I, mean, I don't know, man. expect the unexpected. I, I think it I think it has the potential to get very, very unexpectedly weird, which would be delightful. Uh, thanks for hanging out, Em. Thanks for having me. Your phone calls and an SEC stat of the day coming up next.
All right, quick to the phones, and we'll get an SEC stat of the day in, shall we? How about Coach T in Nashville up next? What's happening, Coach? Man, good morning, guys. How you guys doing this morning? We're living fine. I hope you are, too. Hey, I love the, I love the football thing, man. That is hilarious, man. That is, that's awesome. I feel like you're the only one, Coach. I feel like we get yelled at about that one a lot, but it's too it's too much fun. We're going to do it anyway. I'm telling you, I, I just want to tell you guys thank you. And going back to uh, the freak himself may still look good, and I want to thank Al Smith for inviting me out. One of the local coaches here has got an ear to the ground in Nashville, a lot of kids, a lot of youth, a lot of family members. And um, the uh, press conference was absolutely awesome. You know, you had uh, Miss McDonald there from the health department, Brenda Haywood from the deputy mayor, including the mayor's wife was there. And uh, all the Titans that was there, including uh, Warren Moon, uh, those guys look like they could step on the field right now and play today, including Chris Johnson. I think he can still put up 100 yards for us. Hey, I, Blaine, Blaine looks like he gets a little itchy every once in a while. I'm afraid he's going to come across the table and tackle me on the pregame show. But, yeah, it was really cool of them to do the event. And uh, and thank you for the call, Coach. We appreciate that. 615-737-1045. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, cool dudes doing good work in the community and making a making an impact. I mean, all those guys do a lot of different stuff. Anyway, SEC stand of the day. Oh, Wait, I thought this was once a week. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about the SEC. Let's talk about Nick Saban and Josh Heupel in the SEC. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about the SEC. Let's talk about Brian Kelly and Greg Sankey in the SEC. Let's talk about sex. The SEC stat of the day is zero for zero for zero yards, zero touchdowns, and zero interceptions. That is the stat line of Florida starting quarterback, Jack Miller. No, wait, damn it. You didn't answer my question. I thought that was a once a week thing that I had to hear in my ears. Mm, why would you not want to hear that more than once a week? You're right. It's art. Tomorrow, the first SEC team involved in a bowl game will be Florida playing 14th ranked Oregon State in the SRS, SRS distribution Las Vegas Bowl. I'm sorry, what? Um, <laughs> I, the the sponsor names make these bowl games funny. No, and they, they've they have gotten it. They they've mangled gotten, them. They've gotten out of control. <laughs> it feels like, but uh, it is also to me extraordinarily early to have a bowl game involving an SEC team on day two of bowl mania. I don't remember that typically being the case. Yeah, I feel like we usually have to wait at least a week before we start seeing these uh, you know power five matchups involving SEC teams, but. Uh, six and six Florida and 14th ranked Oregon State. Oregon State, you know, had a really strong season, finishing nine and three. Crazy comeback to beat Oregon in the in the rivalry game to close out the regular season. They will have uh, most everyone at their disposal. Florida most certainly will not. So I read that stat line, uh, which is a bunch of zeros for Jack Miller, a former four star quarterback who transferred from Ohio State in the offseason, was the third stringer for Florida. Uh, Jalen Kitna is the quarterback that would be starting this oh, game, but no. horrific situation in we Florida. We have not talked about that at all. He was arrested on child pornography charges, dismissed from the team. Yikes. Obviously, that was a very ugly situation to come out a couple of weeks ago. So Jack Miller gets the start because Anthony Richardson has declared for the draft. He has opted out, and we know essentially nothing about Jack Miller except that he was a four-star prospect, very highly recruited, buried on the depth chart at Ohio State, and transferred to Florida. And Oregon State, 10-point favorites in this game, the Las Vegas Bowl tomorrow, a 1.30 kickoff from Allegiant Stadium. So I am intrigued because that's the first SEC team playing where you uh, are going to see a quarterback that you essentially know nothing about and have probably never seen thrown a pass because he's only attempted 14 of them in his college football career. They all came in a backup role at Ohio State. Uh, but with that, Anthony Richardson mm -hmm. moves on to the NFL draft, and Robert and I were looking at some way too early mock drafts yesterday and it oh is God, amazing. Wait, wait, were, were you really? Thank you for not bringing that on air. And that's what you two are doing while I'm doing a radio show? You're looking at mock drafts? Uh, I can't remember. I mean, Robert had it pulled up. We were Do you know that's everything I hate about sports radio? And you guys are just, you're, you're back there. It's like it's like the scene in Heavyweights where they're hiding candy in the in the bedposts and stuff like that. You're back there with your mock draft stash? Well, it, after it, I told you how much I hate those things? And I hate them too. But it's hard. not true. You're it, back there snorting them. No, but, but I like to be angry about things. And when we talk about... <laughs> The fact that uh, measurables, you know, matter so much more for quarterbacks other, you know, over just being good at football. Uh, 
these mock drafts that you're seeing are the examples of that because you've got Will Levis being projected as the number two pick oh in the draft. Oh, my God, I saw that. You've got Stop. Anthony Richardson consistently being projected as a top ten pick no, that's in a, the NFL that's draft. this year's Malik Willis. No way. Not just flatly no way. Right? Anthony Richardson is not going top ten in the NFL. I mean, it's mind-boggling. No, but not, and I, I'm not just saying that because it sounds ridiculous. I'm saying that because I've talked to football people about this, too, and they're like, I wouldn't have come out this year. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. That, no, top. He's he's being Malik Willis. Anyway, I can't believe you're back there looking at mock drafts. <laughs> I'm ashamed. That, that, <laughs> that is the SEC stat of the day. So we've got the hometown lenders. That the, these names are ridiculous. What the hell is the Wasabi Fenway Bowl? What is that? We we're gonna, we're going to do this at 11:45 because th- there are too many to go through. The Wasabi Fenway Bowl tomorrow morning. Jimmy Kimmel has a bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he brought the entire Washington State football team on his show the other night um, <laughs> because they're playing Fresno State in the okay, Jimmy Kimmel I- LA uh, in the Jimmy Kimmel LA Bowl. It's at SoFi for God's <laughs> sakes. I love that. That's great. All right, so we'll we'll go through how how just uh, utterly absurd these bowl games names are. I feel like that's the best way that we could possibly do bowl game coverage today. I think that really suits our uh, skill set. In the meantime, we're going to get into a discussion about the Tennessee Titans, a big game coming up against the Los Angeles Chargers. And the question is, what parts and pieces are they going to have back? We're going to tell you about another injury situation and an update on a player who they very much need coming up next.
It is 11.01. Good morning from the Superbook.com Sports Desk. I'm Lucas Panzica. The San Francisco 49ers clinched the NFC West with a 21-13 win over the Seahawks on Thursday night football. 49ers quarterback Brock Purdy, 217 yards and two touchdowns. The Nashville Predators grabbed a point in Winnipeg but have lost five in a row, a 2-1 to one loss in overtime to the Jets. They will travel to the Colorado Avalanche tomorrow night. And bowl season is underway at the moment. It is UAB playing. Who are the Blazers playing? Either way, they're leading 7 to nothing. Oh, Miami, Miami of Ohio. Of Ohio. Thank you. Titans travel to L.A. on Sunday, looking to end a three-game losing skid against the Chargers. Christian Fulton, Traylon Burks, Dontrell Hillier did not practice Thursday. Robert Woods and Danico Autry did practice. Mike Vrabel will update who will be out on Sunday at about 1 p.m. The lead company countdown to kickoff starts at noon central on Titans countdown at 2 p.m. for a 325 central kickoff between Titans and Chargers from SoFi Stadium with Mike Keith, Coach Mack, and the rest of the Titans radio crew. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once in your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. What is happening? Hour number two underway. Off to a high-flying start with all the production value that comes with a Lucas Panzeca breaking news update. He asked, who is UAB playing in the middle of a sponsored bit? Bravo what? by you. Live radio, baby. Yeah, something like that. 615-737-1045. I must admit, we have been terrible the past two days, and I feel like that's where we're at our best. I feel like we're really soaring high right now. And we're only going to get better. Coach Mack's going to be here in 15 minutes. So class the join up. Talk about the Chargers and the Titans. 615-737-1045, as I mentioned, is how you can interact. So, the latest injury designation for the Titans. Oh, by the way, did you see Zach Wilson starting this weekend? Uh, yes. And in honor of bowl season, I appreciate Robert Sala citing his statistic in the 2018 famous Idaho Potato Bowl when Robert Sala said to New York Jets media today, he's still the same quarterback that went 18 of 18 in a bowl game. That's that's not a real line that was uttered in an NFL coach's press conference, is it? Oh, it is. Is there audio of that anywhere? Let's see if I can track it He down. cited a statistic from a 2018 bowl game as to why his quarterback is... Not just any bowl game. Say the the Idaho Potato Bowl? The famous Idaho Potato Bowl. Is it even called that anymore, or has that has that been stripped of us, too, by corporate America and greed? <laughs> We're going to go through some of these bowl, bowl game names later on. But, yes, uh, Zach Wilson is starting. In the meantime, injury designation for the Titans. They, uh, they designated Lonnie Johnson. Oh, you have the Sala thing. Footwork issues, throwing mechanics in three weeks. Uh, good question. Good question. I, I I don't think it's impossible. Um, I don't. You know, he's he's done a really nice job. I thought um, he's had two of his best throwing days in practice. Now practice at the end of the day doesn't matter. We gotta go do it on Sunday. But uh, felt like uh, he's been he's been doing a really good job just finding completions and getting the ball to where he needs to with accuracy. Um, so he's he's done a really nice job. Like I said, working deliberately and just tying everything. And and for him, it's. It's really just making the easy easy with regards to just getting your feet where they need uh, in the direction they need to go, get your body set, and, and deliver the football the way he knows how. And uh, I mean, he's he's the same quarterback that once went 18 for 18 in the bowl game, so he's very capable. It's just a matter of just being conscientious and tying everything together. Get the bleep out of here. That is not something he cited as evidence that Zach Wilson can one day be a good NFL quarterback. I'm pissed. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He's not He's not wrong. Spot the lie. Yeah, he's not that same quarterback because he's in the NFL and he sucks. Like, what? Anyway, 
Uh, Thank was, you for that. I needed that. Uh, a 49 to 18 win for BYU over <laughs> Western Michigan in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl on December 21st, 2018, when Zach Wilson went 18 of 18, 317 yards. Is that his four, true freshman season? Uh, four touchdowns. That has to be his true freshman season, right? I think so, because he came to Tennessee in 2019 as a sophomore, and they won a dramatic late overtime win uh, in over in in Neyland. So yeah, yeah um, yes. Okay, good. I'm glad that that's the standard that we're yes, setting for NFL was a quarterback play at this point in the season. When you're when you're when you're Mike White is banged up, and you have to throw your former first round pick out there that has just been objectively terrible. Anyway. 615-737-1045. Lonnie Johnson's been designated to return. And I uh, I now have them down with one injured reserve return designation remaining. You get eight at the start of the season. They have used seven with Lonnie Johnson. That means that either Kyle Phillips or David Long, or potentially both, depending on who that final spot gets used on, that means that the guy that was supposed to be their legitimate true slot option that does a lot of good in this offense, if you have it as a relief valve and has had to been, you know, basically Dontrell Hilliard this year, or their stud middle linebacker who has been playing really, really at a high level and is in the middle of a contract here. Or, I mean, potentially both of them. I don't know how I don't know how much time David Long's gonna miss at this point. He just went on IR last weekend. And Kyle Phillips, I mean, what what would that even look like at this point? If it's if it's serious enough to keep him down this long, what is the percentage chance that it'll happen again? I I don't know. I don't have the, enough information about the, the the seriousness, the severity of the shoulder injury for Kyle Phillips. So they're kind of. I mean, it's a really difficult spot that they're now in. It's only week fourteen. There's still four more weeks of this stuff. And at some point, something's got to give. Now, I, I apologize. We did not, we did not look up the injured reserve return situation for the postseason or how injured reserve transfers over. I, uh, I, we will do so, Lucas. Don't let me forget because I want to make sure we have that answer for people because that obviously now does matter for this team. If they place another player on injured reserve and we start to bleed into the postseason, what, what does that mean? Um. But yeah, Lonnie Johnson was a surprise. I mean, it's just it's another defensive back, and it's not it's not anything that you look at as as being the galvanized. It's not like Lonnie Johnson was playing a ton of snaps anyway. Josh Kalou plays over Lonnie Johnson, so it's just a special teamer that they're returning. It's uh it's tough sledding right now. Connor is calling us from Spring Hill. What's up, Connor? Buck, how you doing? Good, buddy. Good. So quote me if I'm wrong. Since SoFi Stadium has been built. Titans are undefeated so far, correct? Uh, yeah, I think they've just got the one Sunday nighter out there, right? I think that's correct. Okay. So, I believe Todd Downing's going to have a heyday with this one. Y'all remember when he <laughs> – the Green Bay game. So, I think Williamson County Sheriff's go ahead and open up the uh, jail cells because Todd Downing's coming back. Tighten up, baby. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Not in the best of taste. Uh, I mean, listen, we're, we're, we're going to talk about the, we're going to talk about the idea, uh, of where the Titans offense can have a strategic advantage against this Chargers defense. And so maybe Todd Downing will have a bit of a day. I was, I was curious, I was curious to where that was going to go. The rare call praising Todd Downing or saying that, you know, your boy's going to have a big bounce back. Um, I would imagine that the circumstances that led to the first incident after Green Bay, there are protections against that in the aftermath. That's all I will say about a, a, uh, an alleged recurrence, as, uh, as the last caller just said. Here's the thing about what the Chargers about what the Chargers do worst at this point. They don't protect the quarterback particularly well, but the quarterback has learned how to survive a lot of that, and as the benefit of some legitimate playmaking wide receivers, now as healthy as they've been at any point in the season, provided that Mike Williams' ankle doesn't start to act up again. So they can be, they can be got as far as the disruption of Justin Herbert, but do, they ha- do the Titans have the pass rush right now? We'll see what happens with Danico Autry. Would obviously make a difference. How close is he to 100%? Who's to say? And 
you know, whether it's a diminished version of him coming back like it was with Jeff, can, can that be counted on? Can that be purely relied upon to make a difference in a way that they need difference makers? Then on the defensive side of the ball, looking at Los Angeles and, and Joey Bosa's status still up in the air. I mean, he's still on IR right now. Have they designated him to return? I have not, I don't know that I've seen a designation on Joey Bosa. We'll, again, we'll find that for you here in just a second. Maybe Lucas or Robert would do me a favor on that. But the run defense for Los Angeles has been atrocious. It's just been objectively bad. Um, they uh, they have been uh, they have dealt with some injuries, but it's just it's not a now they allow rushing yards. Like there's a lot of it that's just kind of a Brandon Staley thing. Like they're willing to let you try and beat them on the ground because they're going to go for it. They're going to pass. They're going to Brandon Staley for the amount of fourth downs that he's going for it. He's basically telling you, yeah, I believe my quarterback can get two yards. I believe my quarterback is good enough. My offense is good enough to get the fourth and two or to get the fourth and three, whatever. So I'm just going to keep going for it even when I come away from a red zone trip with no points. And he's been a bit more conservative this season. I mean, yes, but like the standard was insane. And yes. then, you know, he's yeah. obviously your your boy, Brandon Staley. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of pressure on Brandon Staley. Are you looking forward to witnessing a potential Staleying in, in as a live audience member? I would love for the Titans to win on a bonehead going for it on fourth down call on their own 30 or something by Brandon Staley. I feel but, like Mike Vrabel snorts those situations. I feel like Mike <laughs> lives for that. Uh, yeah, my, I mean, Mike Vrabel could probably outcoach Brandon Staley, but uh, there is a lot of pressure on Staley. They're on the outside looking in at the playoff picture right now. If if they were to lose to the Titans and the Jets were to win on Sunday with Zach Wilson and jump the Chargers, Chargers are sitting two spots back of the playoff picture, and uh, you're looking at Justin Herbert having never been to a playoff game after his what, third year in the league on his rookie contract? Well, robbed by his head coach against the Raiders. But well, yes. that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. why the, the, that pressure on Staley is real. This is a playoff roster. It was one last year, and it's it's one this year. And uh, Joey Bosa, uh, by the way, there's no timetable as of yesterday. He, he's not, it's not looking like he's going to play. Okay. Um. So, well, I still have Khalil Mack, so good luck. Uh, they are a bottom five rushing defense. Now, wait. Are you saying that there's pressure on Brandon Staley because you have read and, and seen things alluding to pressure on Brandon Staley? Or you're just assuming that because of the name, and, you know, it would be a fair assumption. Like, are, is that something you're actually seeing or is that something you're assuming is happening? Because I don't think the Chargers as an organization necessarily operate like a lot of teams. Like, they 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 have a bit of a Bengals kind of connotation to them prior to this year where the Bengals actually spent money to support Joe Burrow. Like, they're not they're not regarded as the most, like, pressing ownership group i don't think um that, that is not something i've seen reported that if staley doesn't get this team to the postseason then uh you know he's going to be fighting for his job i but, just wanted to clarify yeah but he this is year three uh as the, no year two he was first year head coach last year um yeah this is Sounds year right. two for brandon staley as the head coach and, and just for justin herbert i mean he's 16 and 14 in his career so far with la if he can't get this team to the postseason with that roster and that quarterback I mean, he's on his rookie deal. You should be able to maximize these years the way that the Bengals kind of have and did last year. I, I think there should be pressure on Brandon Staley. Oh, no, I'm not. It should and is are two different things. Sure. I'm just saying, like, yeah, you're you're assuming, rightfully so. I, but... I don't know anything about the inner workings of the Chargers franchise and the ownership and what their expectations are, but, uh, but I'm just saying from the outside looking in or if I'm a Chargers fan, I'm thinking, okay, if this guy can't get us to the postseason uh, with this at his disposal, then maybe time to, to look – Look past it. We got phone calls on Titans Chargers. We're going to get to them. Coach Mack will be here as well, and we'll talk some shop as we always do on a Friday. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
We are presented by Spring Hill Heating and Cooling. Go to springhillac.com. Coach Matt going to be here momentarily. Meantime, we got time for some calls on Titans Chargers. Chris, chiming in from Bellevue. Hey, Chris. Hi, how are you? I'm good, bud. I listen to you guys each day. I do roadside assistance. You guys are great. But uh, to go on to what you guys were talking about, I'm a, I've am been a lifelong Chargers fan. Um, I'm very worried about Derrick Henry. If they uh, work around Derrick Henry and put in a couple passes here and there, I think they can throw the Chargers defense off. But I think the Chargers might pull out the win just because they're fighting for playoffs. And also Brandon Staley from the news um, up in L.A., uh, Sean, uh, Sean Payton's name has been floated around if uh, Staley doesn't make the playoffs. You know, I appreciate the call, Chris, and thank you for the kind words. I, I have seen Sean Payton's name start to start to kind of bubble up because we're at that point in the year where people are reevaluating their coaching situations, and, and obviously he's the most famous name and most successful name that's out there. And, uh, you know, he's obviously – he has expressed interest uh, prior to leaving the Saints of, of potentially getting back in a game. So we'll see what happens with, with Brandon Staley and the Chargers, and there's no question – um, the amount of pressure that there should be in a situation like this. I mean, I'm look. I'm I'm glad that we're going to have Mac here in just a second because there's nobody that can really articulate other than somebody who's been in a pressurized situation as either a head coach or an assistant coach, a coordinator uh, or a position coach like Mac has been. It's it's tough to kind of explain how those things can kind of break down, and it. You know, I'm sure it varies from staff to staff, depending on uh, depending on what the situation is. But uh, Coach Mack joins us now, as he always does, presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. They've been protecting Tennesseans for 75 years. Hey, buddy. Hey, Buck. How you doing? I was just talking to Lucas before we came on. Said you guys are going to uh, stay over in L.A. on Monday. That'll be good. I was giving him some spots to go to so get him some extra money and uh, let him go some places i uh well listen he's probably just gonna steal it from my wallet i, I don't have the opportunity to give it to him he, he tends to try and lift things off me from time to time already have yeah let's, let's see he's, he's, he's already got my credit card mac but no i know you're the man about town i mean you're the man about town about just about everywhere you go mac uh but i know la is a is a special place to i know you had some good years out there yeah i mean that uh you guys won't get a whole lot of time out there but uh, he said this is his first time, so yeah. if it's your first time visiting L.A., there's a lot to see. No question. Well, this game is going to be one of the things that we're going to see at SoFi Stadium, and certainly uh, a critical game for both teams, one jockeying to get into the postseason picture and the other one trying to, to snap a, a bit of a skid here in the last couple of weeks. Mac, I, it's 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 varies from team to team, and, and coaching staff, no locker room is probably created exactly equal, but I, I feel like people tend to overrate the the like the mindset that players have when they have a losing streak like this like I don't think anybody in that locker room approaches their job much differently because they're still trying to prepare to win a football game and at the core of it like it's not like the messaging has changed no there's no messaging that changes and and the the issue is Buck at this time of year and it's not only here but uh, here's what we care about is is the number of injuries that you have that that you know that, that start to eat into what you're able to do and when you're when you're constantly you know having to change people every week, and then you have people that are injured that aren't getting back, well then you know that that alters what you do. But it does not alter the approach. It may alter some of the things that you're able to do. But the, the approach and the mindset. This is a week to week business, and you know I've been involved in it for a long time. The professional athletes they're playing for a lot of things, but they're, the most thing they're playing for is a successful weekend. That's what they're all playing for. But you know people don't you know understand dynamics of a of a professional locker room because you know a lot of the outside noise never really affects it what does affect it is the number of people that you that you have to play and the number of people that you are new coming into what you're trying to do in a short period of time you know to try to put together a game plan that will be successful we all know though that uh, any game plan is not successful if you start helping your opponent like what happened last week you've got to eliminate that 
you know, before you have a chance to do anything. And I think that's what they're aiming for to begin with. Yeah, I mean, there's no question. You're, you're negative four in the turnover differential. You're, you're a sinking ship at that point. You're giving away the game, literally. Um, as far as as far as far the uh, – a couple of other things, though, that occurred in that game, though, Mac. Dylan Cole has been really, really sound all year long. And I know he was – he was uh, he was obviously emotional because of the the hard work that all of these guys put in to to try and get it to Sunday, and he was I think he was a bit disappointed in himself and his own performance. But you know how big of uh, of a loss right now, despite Dylan Cole having played all year long, how big a loss right now is D- uh, David Long? That's a big loss with any of these starters they have out, which they have a lot of. Yeah. I mean it's a it's a big loss. I mean David Long was a uh, was an integral part of this team, just like the guys that. Uh, the uh, Titans have lost up front. The Titans, the guys, the Titans have lost in the back end. It's a look. Anytime you lose a starter, being a starter in the National Football League over an extended period of time gives you a lot of gives you a lot of pluses going into a ball game. You know the experience, and of course you're there because of your ability. You lose those guys for an extended period of time. It's a it's a it's a loss. Now guys, you know, step in and they're getting paid too, but they step in. Uh, it's just it, it's different. And look, Dylan Cole has been a guy that's, that's that's been fighting for a roster spot, you know, ever since he came into the league. And now, because of the circumstances, he gets a chance to play, and clearly, it means a lot to him. Look, it th- this is these guys' livelihood. Yeah. And their their window is very short. It's their livelihood. So yeah, it means a lot to him. But you ask me how much it it, it hurts to it hurts to have David Long, and then you start adding the multiple other people that you're missing. That starts to that starts to wear on you. Just another name on a long, long list of players. Again, the Titans leading the league in players that have dressed for them this season for a second straight season, and the only team doing so by such a wide margin, and still a playoff team. It's it's crazy that this is a thing. Yet again, to such an extent, uh, Mac, the, the, the chargers, I mean, they have been, they are dangerous at any given point when you have a quarterback like that and a lot of the skill position players that they have, but Mike Williams being back in that lineup, I mean, he, he's just a terror to watch. And it seemed, it seemed like there was just, there's no drop off between those two. He caught all six of his targets. He was making contested catches, big plays down the field. How much, how much more potent does he make them? Well, quite a bit. I mean, that's their big play guy. I mean, that's their vertical guy. You know, Mike Williams, and, and, and paired with, uh, you know, for our listeners, we always we always like to to give our listeners, you know, a little deeper dive. Paired now with with Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler, you've got guys that can attack yeah. all three levels of your defense through the air. And and look, Justin Herbert. I mean, this is a legitimate franchise quarterback. As a young player, you start watching him and start seeing his skill set, especially the last five weeks, Buck. I mean, it really sounds like we just reround the tape from what we're talking about going into that game with Trevor Lawrence. These are young players that are starting to come into their own at a very, very critical position. But, you uh, you know, Justin Herbert is the best quarterback in the league as far as, as throwing on the move, as far as production. I mean, it's just – it's documented. And you watch it and you start to see it. And so if once you have Mike Williams back, which is their vertical threat, you get Keenan Allen back, which is one of the best possession receivers in the in the game. And possession receiver is not a derogatory term. Yeah. I mean this is a this is a chain mover dude, you know, and so you have him plus with Austin Eckler, I mean, look at Eckler's numbers catching the football. Yeah, you know, and it just you know, look at what at what he's doing catching the football. So as I said, you've got now elements that can attack all three levels of your defense in the throwing game. You've got to be able to affect this quarterback. I mean, that goes without saying. And you've got to be able to affect a cylinder. But you're going to have to you're going to have to have you know a very aggressive, disciplined rush on this guy because on this guy because once he escapes either inside or outside, I mean, he can create real problems because he's very accurate throwing on the move. And he also can reach all parts of the field. Well, and you mentioned Coach Mack here with us, Titans uh, Radio, Titans at the Chargers in L.A. A 325 kickoff. You can hear coverage uh, all day long right here on 104.5 The Zone. And, of course, Titans countdown with the whole crew, Mack and Mike, on the call. Um, the, the last couple of weeks in particular, Mac, the way that they've kind of leaned into that so much, the way that they move him. I mean, some, sometimes he's moving outside of the pocket out of necessity. Obviously, missing Rashawn Slater is a big deal. And, and their offensive line has has its own uh, issues at, at any given point. But I think the way that they've leaned into that even more, I thought that was as evident in any game that I watched this year than the most recent one, the Dolphins, where he just absolutely killed them on the outside. 
Well, he did, and it's not only that. And see, and, and what and what they're doing now with him because you know their run game. I mean, that's part of their run game, Buck. When you look at it and you start breaking it down, like a defensive coach would break it down, yeah. is is getting him on the edge and not all the way on the edge, just kind of that half half boot, half roll stuff. Anytime he breaks to to you know to green space, either right or left outside the tackle box, then you're running a full boot or you're escaping pressure. But that half roll stuff, that half boot stuff, where you can get protection off of the, you know, it, it, it's a it's a it's a quasi play action type of a thing. But he can move a little bit and manipulate that pocket. I mean, that's to their advantage, especially if you've got receivers that can that can manipulate the second level, not necessarily the third level. And then what you start doing with that is once the defense starts creeping up, then Mike Williams comes into effect because that is their that's their home run dude. So. It, yeah, it's a it's a when you've got a quarterback that is accurate from those types of platforms, then you can do some things. No small task for the Titans defense, and uh, they'll await some positive news potentially on Danico Autry as he tries to get himself up and running again after a couple of limited days at practice. On the other side of the ball, Mac, obviously their rushing defense has been um uh bottom five in the league pretty consistently this past year derrick henry having things figured out in the first half and i you know i mean i think we touched on it earlier it seems as simple as turnovers because they had they were cooking like they hadn't i heard mike say on the broadcast i was listening to you guys while i was sitting in the press box as i always do and the idea that they had scored the titans offense 14 points for the first time since that that october game at indianapolis in week four like they were they were really figuring out ways to win um, and then obviously sandbag themselves. Well, the run game is, is, is essential. It's going to be essential this week. And, and the run game, you know, I did, a, you know, you always do a weekly thing for, you know, for beneath the surface for Microsoft. Mm-hmm. And we highlighted, you know, some of those, some of those run plays and they were blocked extremely well last week. I mean, that run game was ginning, but all of a sudden, if you, if you all of it, because of the turnovers, you find yourself three scores down and the score separated like that, then your run game becomes inconsequential because now you're fighting a separation of score, Buck, and you're also fighting the clock. And so what has to happen is absolutely. I mean, this, the, the run game has to be something that, that you lean on, but you, when, you're, when you're working your run game, you cannot afford turnovers, especially when you d- get turnovers in, in, you know, in, in plus territory. You just cannot do it. I mean, that's just – that and giving up explosives is not a good formula to win games. And so your question out there in, at SoFi, yes, we need to run the football against this Chargers defense. Chigakonkwo has been, you know, capable all year long. Mac obviously he's earned more opportunities. They they appreciate all they ask him to do uh, between special teams and obviously blocking and everything else uh, that a rookie tight end is asked to do in that system. But the way that you've seen him is—is is there a specific way that you've seen him? I guess develop more. Is it just b- about the opportunity that he's, that he's earned and he's taking advantage of it with the talent that we already knew he had? But I really like – I mean, I like his growth. I like his maturity in there. I mean, there's a lot to learn, you know, as to the, the role that he was going to play. And, and here's the other thing. With the ball in his hands, this guy's a physical, physical dude. Yeah. He's a physical dude. I mean, and he's got speed. That, look, I mean, we're, we're watching a, a really nice young player just mature and grow right before our eyes. I think the tight end position has been a position that has e- incrementally gotten better and gotten more involved as the season has gone, has gone along. Uh, and especially if you could keep the score from being separated so so much, you could see even more of these guys. He and Hooper both, I think, have done a really nice job as of late. But a lot of that gets overshadowed when you lose ball games because the 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 point of emphasis is winning the ball game. But you start digging deeper into it, and you ask me about Chig. I really like the growth that I've seen, both athletically and both uh, you know nuance wise, and also just experience wise of of what Chig has done. From you know, from the beginning of this season to right now, I mean, when he scored that touchdown and, and helicoptered into the end zone, you know, my call was Chig is playing big, and Chig has been playing big for a while now. Nah, rat- rattled off a natural coach Mac here with us on 104.5 The Zone. Yeah, I mean, it, it, they you talk about chain movers for the for the Chargers, they were getting good production out of Austin Hooper, as you mentioned, that got overshadowed, and and Robert Woods had a productive game. Like he was, I, I heard you mention several times the way that he was able to readjust to the ball as only a veteran wide receiver who's seen a lot of, who understands the, the landmarks, understands where he's at and understands what the quarterback is trying to do with him to be able to make the adjustments to make plays on that. It was a shame that it got squandered that way. 
Well, but you, you, you and, and you, <clears throat> let me just say this: all of those things are good if you can keep if you can keep either ahead of the score or yeah. you can keep it even where you can do all those things. When you're three scores down, I've called defenses in this league for a long time. You can change what you do defensively, and you can negate a whole lot of those things because you're just you're 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 just playing you're, you're not playing fifty fifty. You're not in conflict as a defense when the score is separated by three scores or more. So that's what has to happen first. And you're right. Then we can start to use all those other pieces. You know, even though we're missing a lot of pieces on both sides of the ball, you can keep the game relatively close or get ahead. Then you've got a chance to do something. That's what has to happen, Buck. And you, you just can't turn it over. That's what you cannot do right now. Yeah, that's the, that's the core of the and also entire discussion. Let me just say this. Yeah. And I don't mean to interrupt you, but to me it's important, too, that the, that the defense somehow finds ways to, to create some turnovers, you know, like, you know, like, Big Jeff, batted the ball up in the air. You know, sooner or later, that's got to come to us. You know, get a get a contested catch downfield. Slap it out of a quarterback's hands. Do, you know, turnovers are real mitigating factors this late in the season. And they haven't had one since Denver. It's uh, It's been a critical drought for them over the course of the time. Mac, you 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 know you understand you have license to interrupt me at any point. Like, it's not it's not that deep. You do what you want. <laughs> Look, I, I, I would never interrupt you. Uh, the only time I'd ever interrupt you is if I think you're going way – way way off the off your wheels and you never do keep your powder dry coach mac in the booth mike <laughs> and mac on sunday with the titans at the chargers a 325 kick coverage all day long right here on 104.5 the zone and across the titans radio network thank you buddy safe travels and i'll see you in the booth uh, yeah buck i will see you in the booth let me just get a shout out to randy wilmore and farm bureau health plans again i know that that you always you do a nice job of 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 saying how they sponsor me on this but those are wonderful people and they deserve a shout out absolutely they make a lot of great titans radio content possible thank you buddy see you buck that's coach mac best in the business all right we will uh take a quick break 615-737-1045 if you want to break down any of the information even further that you heard from mac there a lot of good discussion to be had coming up next we are going to take a look at some of these bowl games because who's playing uab lucas miami of ohio excellent are they the redbirds uh red hawks perhaps a cardinal there's too many of them it is some type of red bird okay well there's nothing to distinguish it based on their uniforms either way we're going to make fun of bowl game names next
Bowl mania. 10-0 UAB over Miami of Ohio in the hometown lenders Bahamas Bowl. Here's what I'll say, because we're going to make fun of goofy bowl names. Lucas has them all categorized. He's fired up. It's the most prepared I've seen him in years. Uh, it is great branding just because of how, if I feel like if you lean into the most outrageous, like weirdest looking bowl name, like it's going to get you the best value for your dollar. If you're some, if an organization is sponsoring these, because like, what's the first thing I'm going to do when I'm going through the bowl? What the hell is the wasabi bowl? I do uh, have questions about that one. The wasabi Fenway bowl. Yeah. Like is wasabi like the food? Just sponsoring the bowl game, or is it's, there actually a company called Wasabi? It's probably like like that 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 one in uh, Germantown that I thought was a restaurant for the longest time. It's like a like a software development company, Red Pepper. Like it's just sitting over there by like Gerst House and uh, uh, or Geist House and uh, and neighbors, like right there in Germantown. I thought it was the restaurant for the longest. I walked in there one time and it was like like some kind of like you know uh, collective. <laughs> like oh, I need to leave. I'm sorry. I mean, now I need to find out. What the sponsor is, what wasabi actually is. Well, yes, that would make the exercise a bit more uh, as as informed as humanly possible, as you know we like to be. Wasabi Technologies. Nah. Who'd have thunk? All right, so rattle off the categories for the audience, and we'll go through these things together because it's only going to get more ridiculous. The hometown lender, it's the most mild of the bowls. They're easing you into it. The most mild of the bowl names. Well, uh, we have funny both in the bowl names and the potential bowl matchups. We have teams that we never dreamed could be in a bowl game that made it into bowl mania. And we have actually interesting bowl games involving SEC schools. So starting with the funny, we just talked about the Wasabi Fenway Bowl because when I think of Boston, I think of sushi. And that's Cincinnati and Louisville playing at 10 a.m. tomorrow at Fenway Park. Um, Kerry Combs, the interim head coach, for the Cincinnati Bearcats, as mm. Luke Fickle moves on to Wisconsin, Combs will be retained by Scott Satterfield. And that's the fun twist in this game, that Scott Satterfield hired away from Louisville by Cincinnati, and now Louisville and Cincinnati get to play each other. Satterfield has removed himself from this bowl game. Uh, I have no idea if this game will be any good. Both teams will be with backup quarterbacks. You do not get Malik Cunningham, who's been fun to watch at Louisville over the last few years. So I really – these games are wild cards because the point spreads are all over the place. Right. Uh, How could you so possibly many... <laughs> predict a point spread or, or accurately form a point spread if you're Vegas? Like yeah. this This probably oh, – I, I, don't, I don't know this to be fact. I, we'd probably like text Todd Furman or somebody – Alan Bell maybe, somebody smarter than us. Just like how much how much bowl season kind of skews like Vegas's win percentage because it's just it's got to be all over the place. How do you know what Jack Miller is going to do for Florida in the SRS Distribution Las Vegas Bowl against 14th ranked Oregon State? It's just it's a, you can't find a comedically <laughs> better name than that one. Uh, his first pass in this game will be his 15th career pass as a college football player. Uh, so we discussed that one already. The guaranteed rate bowl between Oklahoma State and Wisconsin. Luke Fickle's coaching in this game. Oh, is he? Yes. Every once in a while, you'll see that. When a coach takes over, he just wants to get right on it, and he coaches the bowl game. Uh, you saw it a, a, a couple of years ago. I think Sonny Dykes did it at SMU uh, when he took over. Well, I kind of like that because it gives you the – I mean, if you don't already have your heart set on on certain positions within the staff, like it gives you a good real-time way to kind of learn from how they go about their jobs to evaluate them to see how it's executed in, in real game-time situations. I, I, I think I like that approach a lot. Music City Bowl uh, might be the funniest for obvious reasons. It's not funny. I mean, we talked about it earlier this week. It's the, so funny you left off the sponsor. There, you read every other sponsor. Oh, the that, trans. I'm sorry, the Trans Perfect Music City Bowl. I'm still trying to uh, figure out what that is. Tra it's a translation company. Oh. Uh, that you know businesses can use when they're working internationally and stuff like that. That's very functional. Uh, yeah, I remember going to the press conference where they officially named. Uh, they went from Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl to the Trans Perfect Music City Bowl. Why did you go to that press conference? Um, for the zone. Big news. Oh. Um, so that's that probably has potential to be the funniest. The trans perfect music no, city bowl, Iowa and Kentucky. It's gonna make me sad. It's uh, gonna make yeah, me sad. but 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 bad and sad college football is is highly entertaining. It's yeah. it's way more entertaining than bad, you know, NFL games. Well, there's just so much more disaster potential. Like right. coaches in the NFL are petrified. The thing that they're scared most of beyond a fifteen yard penalty is a turnover. Like, yeah. That that so they're if anything, they're just going to default to turtling and running the football and, and being, you know, they're not going to take risks. Like a college football ball game, it has the potential to get to completely nuts. Like, completely nuts. Because you don't know how yeah. many of these players who are playing currently 
are going to see the field. You don't know how many more opportunities guys like this are going to be are going to have given recruiting classes and stuff like that. So it's just for the same reason that it's a mess in Vegas, it's a mess on the field. I want this game to be three to two in the final seconds of the fourth quarter in <sighs> Kentucky or Iowa. I really Why don't do you care. like that? Uh, I, I want it to be three to two with thirty seconds left, lining up a nineteen yard field goal to win, and I want it to be shanked. I want it to be shanked thirty yards to the left, and I want the three to two final that we haven't gotten since Mississippi State and Auburn did it many years ago. Ugh. Okay, teams that we never dreamed could be in a bowl game. The Myrtle Beach Bowl, UConn and Marshall. Marshall yeah. eight and four. They beat Notre Dame earlier this year. That was mm-hmm. probably their peak this season. And what Jim Mora has done for the UConn Huskies, taking them from one and eleven to six and six in a bowl game. They are going to be fired up to play in this game, which is kind of another new metric nowadays that you need when you're evaluating these games. Okay, who wants to be there who more, actually wants more to than play the in other? This ball game? UConn's going to be fired up to it's play a, in this bowl it's game. It's a cliche in any other football game except bowl games because yeah. there's a real chance that not most people don't want to be there. Uh, I didn't know that. I mean, Marshall's got an incredibly stout defense, 16.2 points per game. Oh, they just flat out dominated Notre Dame in the trenches in yeah. that game, early oh, well, that, season. You talk about hideous games. Yeah. Uh, ah, the, the honorary, I, I think we should, I don't know if you have any notes on this, the honorary Zach Wilson famous Idaho Potato Bowl. San Jose State Spartans and Eastern Michigan Eagles. You have anything for me on that? I got, I got nothing for you on okay. that one. Other than Zach Wilson once went 18 for 18 in, I, in yes. an Idaho the, potato bowl game. The great 2018 performance. Um, now, speaking of teams that are thrilled to be there, Kansas is playing in Memphis against Arkansas in the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. Home game for Arkansas. Kansas, I know, you know, finished 1-6 and six down the stretch uh, after a 5-0 and o start, but still, uh, Lance Leipold getting that team to bowl eligibility is an impressive feat. Uh, they're going to be fired up to be there. Uh, there are some interesting SEC matchups coming up here. We've talked about the Orange Bowl. We're going to talk more about the Orange Bowl. That one's a given. The Tax Slayer Gator Bowl between Notre Dame and South Carolina – intrigues me that's a fun one yeah and south carolina you know has had a couple guys hit the portal and marshawn lloyd and tight end jaheem bell spencer rattler is weighing whether or not he wants to declare for the nfl draft Uh, but i think there could be some juice in this one uh notre dame you know i haven't seen any official announcement from michael mayer the notre dame tight end that projects as a first round pick oh no i saw coming draft i saw michael mayer and the uh the linebacker isaiah is it foskey i think they both opted out okay yeah Opted out to get ready for the draft. So, so future future Tennessee Titan Michael Mayer will not be playing <laughs> in this in this bowl game. So a that's human Frankenstein. That's two teams that uh, that will be missing key players. I'm interested in that game. The Sugar Bowl. How bad does Bama want to be there? And uh, K- Kansas State is going to be thrilled to be there. And oh th- sure, they're going to have Deuce Vaughn like a bowling ball, uh, just hammering Alabama's defensive front with like 30 carries. And Alabama is going to have to figure out. Bryce Young hasn't officially opted out, but it's hard to imagine he plays. So, uh, you'd like to think that you'll get a look at Ty Simpson and Jalen Milrow for Alabama at quarterback. I think that's reason enough to watch this game and to see if Alabama shows up. Because, you know, you go back and look at the losses, postseason losses in in the Nick Saban era. uh, Most of them are bowl games that they didn't want to be in. I mean, you think about the, the Sugar Bowl against Utah early on, the Capital One Bowl. Uh, oh, no, they won that Capital One Bowl game. But they lost the Sugar Bowl against Oklahoma back in 2014. wonder if we get something similar here. How does your brain move as fast as your mouth does during these segments? Like, it, it's utterly perplexing to me. It's a scientific mystery. Remember to breathe. The most disappointing name change. Ooh. The Outback Bowl is now the ReliaQuest Bowl. It has to be the Outback Bowl by a mile. Just because of, because of the significance. We were talking about this with Emily Proud. Like the idea that there's no more celebratory blooming onion, yeah. Like that, that should Come still on. be a thing. It's like the it's like the turkey leg on Thanksgiving. That should be a thing in NFL games. It is. It should be a thing in college football. You've robbed us of all our tradition. The you get the the blooming onion and coconut shrimp thing, and, and you've got the the mascot blooming onion dancing around on the sidelines. When's the last time you've been to an outback? Long time, long time. It has to be like grade school. Um, but uh, you know, on a serious note, I I am really looking forward to seeing Mississippi State play in this game against Illinois, Zach Arnett, the first time he will be the acting head coach of the Bulldogs. Obviously, he gets the permanent gig after the tragic passing of Mike Leach earlier this week. Um, So I think Mississippi State is going to be fired up for this game. Uh, They're going to go out there. They're going to play hard for Coach Leach. And it is fitting that this game is happening at Raymond James Stadium where there's a big pirate ship behind one of the end zones. So I don't know. I might get the cowbell out for this one. I I, I want to see Mississippi State pull this one out. You own a cowbell? I don't own a cowbell.
Why would you say get the cowbell It's out? a metaphor, man. I want Mississippi State to win the game. Okay. Just be like a normal person and say it that way. Instead, I'll get the cowbell out. You don't have a cowbell. What are you doing? Theater of the mind. <laughs> Did you, did you get to everything that you wanted to get to? There's a lot of stuff there that you just hammered people with. I'm satisfied. All right, very good. 615-737-1045. Let's get back to the Titans and the Chargers. You're going to hear Greg Cosell's analysis of Justin Herbert, how he was so effectively able to dismantle this Dolphins defense and what kind of challenges he poses. That's coming up next. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
It is 1201. Good afternoon from the Superbook.com Sports Desk. I'm Lucas Panzica. The Titans traveled to Los Angeles on Sunday. They look to end a three-game losing skid against the Chargers. Christian Fulton, Traylon Burks, Dontrell Hilliard, all among players that did not practice on Thursday. Robert Woods did practice in full. Danico Autry was once again a limited participant. Mike Vrabel will let us know in about an hour who will be out on Sunday around uh, 1 p.m. You can hear that on Blaine and Mickey. The Lee Company countdown to kickoff starts at noon central with Titans countdown at 2 p.m. It is a 325 central kickoff between Titans and Chargers from SoFi Stadium with Mike Keith, Coach Mack, and the rest of the Titans radio crew. Tennessee basketball has won eight in a row. The six-ranked Vols are at ninth-ranked Arizona Saturday night. Tip-off is at 9.30. You can hear the Vol Network call right here on the zone. And bowl season underway. It is halftime at the Bahamas Bowl, and UAB leads Miami of Ohio 10-6. to For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Third down on a Friday. you love to see it. Going to finish strong here with you guys. We're here with you until 1 o'clock. Jump in however you like, 615-737-1045. That's the phone number. You can call Robert and Lucas. They're back there doing God knows what. You can interact on Zone TV, Facebook Live, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. We're live streaming there. You can hang out in studio with us. Maybe you'll even get some great dating advice or childhood trauma. Maybe some sports talk even at some point. Get into the Titans and Chargers here in just a second. Well, we might as well do it now, as a matter of fact. Unless there's other bowl updates that you're dying to pepper people with. I, I cannot, you, you, don't, you don't breathe during those segments, and I worry about you. I sit here and I watch your face get bluer and bluer as you go through this. And I feel like I have to remind you. Like It's like one of those, it's like a turkey. Is that a real thing that the turkey is like? They look up in the rain and they open their mouths and then they drown. Is that a real thing that happens? I've never heard that before. I think that's a thing. Some kind of mass turkey genocide. They're just idiots. Who knew? Anyway, uh, maybe Google that. Not on a work computer. Was that a roundabout way to insult me? What just happened? I don't know what happened there. Anyway, uh, Chargers and Titans. <laughs> they are going to play at SoFi Stadium. Lucas and I are flying out. I'm flying out tomorrow morning. Lucas will be there on Sunday. And uh, and we will see what there is to be seen. But Justin Herbert, in his last four games, seven touchdowns, one interception. Uh, they have two wins and two losses in those games. Wins over Arizona and Miami. Losses to the Raiders and the Chiefs uh, thus far this season. So, Justin Herbert, as he tries to get this thing cranked up a little bit, because for all, for all of his statistical passing success and he was great he was great against the Dolphins um they have a lot of different ways that they can hurt you what they have been doing though in these last four and I think Mac even mentioned the uh the San Francisco game a a loss but a game where they were starting to figure things out around him the way that they get him outside the pocket and the way that it helps him I think just generally see the field better and I don't know why that is he's not it's not like a it's not like a Russell Wilson Baker Mayfield thing like Justin Herbert is full-sized he's six four I want to say he's an absolutely huge human being six I'm sorry he's six six two thirty seven so it's not like he has trouble seeing the field behind offensive linemen but something about getting him outside the pocket I mean he's really cooking so I asked uh, Greg Cosell of NFL Films about this on the podcast on Wednesday the podcast called The install available wherever you get your podcast. And this is Greg's breakdown. He moved a lot because he had to. I mean, there were plays in which there was design movement clearly, but their own line, which is not very good, by the way, had issues in pass protection and Herbert was forced to move. And he was outstanding with his downfield vision and ball placement on the move. Um, You know, and their offense at its core is incredibly rhythmic. And that, that returns to our conversation about the lack of a pass rush by the Titans. 
Herbert's not necessarily a quarterback, particularly on early downs. Obviously, everything changes on third and long. But on early downs, he's hard to sack because they're very rhythmic. The ball comes out. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a very interesting matchup for the Titans D. And now that they have everybody back because Williams is back, Allen's back. While they were out, Josh Palmer, who you're very familiar with, has showed himself to be a a quality wide receiver who's a really good three and is actually more talented than that and could be more than that, depending on what the future holds. So, you know, you're dealing with a team that has a lot of weapons. They have a really good receiving back in in Eckler. Um, The O-line is an issue. And again, I don't know, you know, based on what's happened with the Titans in recent weeks, um, we don't know at this point. Right now, we'd have to say that their sub front pass rush is a bit of a question mark, you know, unless Autry's back. So that's Greg Cosell's breakdown of Justin Herbert. And the numbers on him um have just been have just been insane. Like he was he was lights out against the Dolphins in particular, and, and Mike Williams coming back, as Greg mentioned, it just opens up so much more. For them, it's a legitimate big play threat uh, who you have to account for. And, you know, in talking about the different ways that the Titans are trying to win, they don't, they're not a big play, they're not an explosive play offense this season. So it is critical that you find ways to disrupt the quarterback. Coach Mack mentioned, you know, getting, uh, getting matching hands basically at the line of scrimmage the way that the Titans do so well. There's a reason T.R. Tart, the nose tackle, was leading the team and passes defense for a considerable amount of time. Because they do that well. Jeff, Tier Tart, uh, Weaver, Bud, when he's available to Nico Autry at this point, they they do well to deflect and, you know, cause the cause the potential for I mean, they did this a bunch with Jayon Brown, David Long as well, where there's just a tip drill. And you turn you create a turnover there because if you're not able to get home to the quarterback, or at least get your hands up. And even that, I mean, they they got they got Trevor Lawrence. Uh, Jeff grabbed him by the elbow one time to disrupt a pass, and then another time just got a hand on it. And they haven't been able to capitalize on those as of late, but just so, so important to be able to attack this guy. You're going to hear from Kevin Byard on Justin Herbert um, later in the show as well, given that that will be a uh, it's a difficult test for the defense. And as we look at the injury report from yesterday, you know, a positive sign to see Danico Autry back in the mix. You uh, any any signs of progress from that dude? Whenever it ends up happening, is going to be such an important thing for this team if they're going to make legitimate noise in the postseason, which is the kind of thing that they're uh, that they're jockeying for right now and trying to hold on to. But beyond that, Traylon Burks continues not to practice. Uh, C.J. Board continues not to practice. Christian Fulton and obviously Dontrell Hilliard has already been ruled out. So without Fulton, Terrence Mitchell, okay. Trey Avery looks like he went from limited to full. At least he's practicing more than we can say about Traylon Burks right now. And hopefully that those uh, both of those guys continue to make process uh, or progress rather. The secondary continues to be mixed and matched beyond Kevin Byard and really Roger McCreary. Andrew Adams has been in the lineup since he needed to be in the lineup and and has done well to earn himself a spot while they try and deploy Amani Hooker in different and more successful ways. But Amani Hooker needs to play better coming off of, coming off of the injury. He's he's had missed opportunities. And I know everybody's a little pressed right now, but they just they need playmakers. They're not getting the turnovers, they're not getting the pressure and at some point uh, it can't it can't continue this way. I mean, it's going to have to continue this way. They're going to have to play these football games one way or the other. But if they are to have legitimate success and not come out of this thing, God forbid, five hundred. If you're a Titans fan, can you imagine? I feel like people would check out. I feel like we would lose people at seven and seven as far as the interest level is concerned. It's kind of like the Preds; they just lost five straight. There's just no buzz around a hockey team right now, other than you know people jockeying to fire the general manager again and now fire. John Hines is the head coach. I, I, I just, I, I feel like the Titans and their fan base, or at least the, I don't want to call them fringe ones, but the people who are just casually there, I feel like you're very much in danger of losing that element, which is not something you can really afford to do. So you're going to hear from Kevin Byard about Justin Herbert coming up next. And the question is, what is the best advantage 
that the Titans have against the Chargers. I'd be curious to know what you guys think of the matchup. 615-737-1045. What one must they win to be able to pull this thing off? I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
The Buck Rising Show is powered by Spring Hill Heating and Cooling. Visit springhillac.com. So, Justin Herbert versus the Titans defense, Derrick Henry against the Chargers' bottom five rush defense. Something's got to give. I hope that at least makes it exciting. Like, I just, I don't want to watch another boring game, you know? Like another one of these things where they just kind of, they slowly peter out and, and, you know, by the fourth quarter, you've already figured out what you're going to write and or whatever the position that I'm going to take the next day on the radio. Oh, poor you. I cover football for a living. Don't bore me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's right. Don't bore me. I'm going to come on the radio and rip you. <laughs> that's exactly right. It's a privilege. It's a one I'm damn grateful for. And also, don't bore me. <laughs> I, uh, But I, I do think it has potential. Like, it's an interesting game. Obviously, beyond the stakes, there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of juice around it because both of the... I mean, the Chargers have, I think, a little more momentum just because they're they're on the outside looking in. And they're trying to continue to make this, uh, make this go and keep tiebreakers over teams like the Jets and now the Jags who are jockeying back into this thing and rooting on the... Praying on the Titans' downfall come Sunday. Jags and Cowboys is a slick, interesting game, too. That's coming up this weekend. And important. It is important. Do you have do you have the specific reason as far as the tiebreakers are concerned? I mean, beyond, you know, that it would be a common opponent? Well, yeah, I mean, every game at, down the stretch here yeah. is critical. Like, you know, any, any opportunity the Titans have to win and the Jags to play a team that they're not going to be favored against, it's a big opportunity. Now, the Texans gave the Cowboys all they wanted last so week. So did the Colts until that, like, until Matt Ryan went nuclear. Like, it was a it was a one-score game. It was. It was a one-score one game when I fell asleep at halftime and then woke <laughs> up to see, like, they did what? <laughs> what was 33 50? points? Good. Scorigami? 33 points in the fourth quarter. It was wild. Yeah, I, I, I really only caught the fourth quarter of that game because then I looked up. I was like, oh, this is, uh, I don't know if it's a good game, but it's it's a game. And then I watched them. I'm like, oh, my God, Matt Ryan, stop. Cut but it out. If the Titans were to win Sunday and get to eight and six, and the Jags were to lose to the Cowboys and drop to five and nine, then you're in a good spot down the stretch where essentially you beat the Texans and you're in. So it's all about how they kind of, you know, for to use the cliche, right the ship. Um, and I think they, uh, <laughs> Jeff Simmons gave a line to us in the locker room after they got their asses kicked by the Eagles. And he said, we're right where we want to be. And it was after they lost 35 to 10. And like, Jeff hasn't had, Jeff hasn't had a lot of losing here. You know, like since 20, 2019 coming in, in 2019, when things were riding high and this looked like a legitimate NFL franchise for the first time in quite some time, like Jeff, I don't know necessarily has had the, I mean, he hasn't had the experience of what it is to be this kind of down. And so, you know, the res- the response was whatever. I-, I guess I take him at his word. He's he's out there chasing. That's what defensive linemen do. Maybe that's natural. Whatever. But, like, right where they wanted to be after 35-10, to 10, and then you lose by two touchdowns to the Jags. And you're just like, okay, you still where you want to be, bud? Like, what's happening here? So, in game planning... Uh, they're gonna have to. They're gonna have to find ways to limit. You're not gonna stop Justin Herbert in this passing game, but you're gonna have to limit it. And to hear Ke- Kevin Byard tell it yesterday on the radio show, it's clear that you know for a great many reasons, this defense has a tremendous amount of respect for the quarterback that they're about to face. Justin Herbert has, like I've said it yesterday in the locker. I feel like he has the best arm in the NFL. Do you remember the old Madden? When Mike Vick was on the cover, matter of fact, this was after Mike Vick. This was Madden when I think it was McNabb, and they finally like introduced this QB vision deal. Oh yeah, when you played quarterback, you had to move the vision thing. Yes, like his vision covers the entire field because you know usually when you didn't have a vision on the receiver you was throwing it to, the ball was inaccurate. It didn't really have a lot of whatever velocity, or whatever it was. But this guy can make a throw from anywhere across the field. Like cause even when you play that game, Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, their vision covered the entire field. All you had to do was just drop back and throw the ball wherever you wanted to. Uh, that's how I feel his arm is. His arm is incredible. Uh, like you said, he can launch the ball from wherever he on his back foot and still throw it 50 yards on the line, on a rope. Uh, so, just like I said, being a DB, just understanding, like, man, when you're a deep post safety, they're going to move the pocket for sure. They have one where they boot out to the left, but then he has a receiver running across the field, and he's literally throwing it directly across the field to the right. He's done it a few times. Uh, so just being disciplined in our zones and us when we play man to understand that, 
hey, did, you know, the play's not over. And like you said, the Miami game, he got one on uh, – Xavier Howard on the Mike Williams deep yeah. down the field, which is pretty impressive. But that's normal to him. Like, he just flicking the wrist, just launch the ball wherever he wants to. So that's Kevin Byard talking about Justin Herbert. And the the bounce back, you know, the question, how do they bounce back? How do they bounce back? What's the message in the locker room? Is the message changing? Ah, nah, nah, nah. Okay. It's, it's still professional athletes playing for contracts, playing for future roster opportunities. And it's, you know, it goes beyond just – like it, it is. It is their professional livelihoods on the line. They're going to respond in kind. Now, whether it's enough remains to be seen. But like, it's not like. And to talk to Coach Mack about this earlier, who's been in these situations, like it's just it doesn't like it's not a drastic shift. Maybe, maybe it should be. We talked about the philosophical issues. Why are you taking? Why are you taking away my bowl game? What is Robert doing over there? Stop it! Cut it out! What are you doing back there? I don't know what he's doing. Well, he's not. He's going to let you explain it for him instead of coming to the microphone. No, let's not. Let's not do this. Let's. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to go into detail about what's on my screen right now. Actually, it looks like Dylan Cole. <laughs> anyway, to continue to try and 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 make these plays, and it really, I mean, I, we could spend we could, we have spent all week talking about this football game. And really what it comes down is to just don't turn the bleeping ball over. For God's sakes, comport yourselves. <laughs> you just want to just grab them by the shoulders and shake them and be like, hey, knock it off. This is not, this is not how, I mean, this is not how you survive at this point. And to get over the loss of Danico Autry has been the one thing that they haven't been able to figure out. Do you, okay, so we, you told me the last time that the Titans had a turnover was Denver. Do you remember who the last player who got the turnover against the Broncos was? Oh, who picked off Russ? I don't. No guesses. Um, Was it Mitchell? It was Terrence Mitchell. Wow. Terrence Mitchell. So the street cat, the alley cat or whatever Mike Vrabel calls him, the dude off the couch, he's the last person to make a turnover for this team. Week 10. Um. They had uh, they gave up the three fumbles and an interception. Derek could have uh, lost another one against the Jags, and they are now minus two on the season where their turnover differential is concerned. So Herbert's coming off this 367-yard passing performance. They're doing a lot of it on the move. They're moving around the platform for him, and it seems to really, really be helping him. So does Mike Williams. He's an important part of this. Uh, the offense... Can you tell me, Lucas, how many total points in the second half this year, either of you, I suppose, since he's back there doing God knows what. <laughs> Don't laugh. It only encourages him. Can either of you tell me how many total points the Titans have scored in the second halves of games this year? Total points. To you're talking every I'm talking about every game season, combined. Every second half of a game combined. Can you tell me how many total points this team has scored heading into week is it week 15? Yes. It's week 15. It is. Is it scary bad? There's only one way to find out. Take a swing. 24. Oh, my God. It's 24. No way. It's 24. You're kidding. No, scary bad. 24. Straight up 24. 5.2 points per second half. And they've scored 24 once in the first half in yeah. Indy. And then petered out. Yeah. No, they've they've got they've gotten moments like that. Like, there are they have several offers in the second half on their record. Thus far this year. Now, they're getting positive contributions at a chig. We've talked about Derek and the run blocking that the offensive line did well until, you know, they coughed the ball up. Uh, the last four games of the season now for Tennessee, I, I don't – do we still have aspirations of a playoff run for this particular football team? Like, what? what is the vibe? Temperature check. 615-737-1045. Like, what is your expectation for the Tennessee Titans in week 15 of 2022? I I mean, I feel like it's varied throughout the course of the season. But, like, I don't outright disbelieve in them anymore. Is that fair to say? Like, I don't know if I'm still buying, like, Mike Vrabel, you know, magic uh, flick of the wrist, and all of a sudden you're in the one seed again. Like, that's obviously off the table. But, like, I don't I don't think they're dead. I mean, they're not by, by percentages. They're not dead. In fact, they're very much comfortable. They've got an 89% chance to win their division still. 
even despite getting drummed by the Jags last week. So like I don't think they're like I don't think they're dead on arrival if they hit the playoffs just because I think there's some things that this team still does well. 14 points in the first quarter, that matters. They had something. You know, uh the caller earlier that brought up, you know, <laughs> for different reasons that Todd Downing is going to be cooking in this game other than, you know, he just wanted to take a crack at Todd Downing. There was there was signs of that in the first half of the uh, in the first half of the Jags game, and then the score separation and and their unwillingness, I think, to push it with their passing game, compounds to make a a game that could have easily been closer make it look worse. So the run game was working until they were kind of forced out of it on Sunday. Yeah. Right? The, so the Jags came back, got the ball in the second half. They had, I think it was almost, I, I think it was over seven minutes. The touchdown, they led a touchdown drive out of the second half or to start the second half, went up two touchdowns, and the Titans came out in that, you know, two tight end set, extra offensive lineman, Derrick Henry run on first down. So if you're going to have high hopes coming into to Sunday's game against the Chargers, it has to be hinged on the run game because obviously that got knocked off kilter with how things played out, the turnover and the Jags scoring back-to-back touchdowns, and suddenly it's midway through the third quarter, you're down by 14. Jags have a top-half rushing defense in the NFL. Uh, Chargers have a bottom five run defense. They're the 28th run defense in the league. They allow 147 rush yards per game. So that's the one thing that going into Sunday you can be optimistic about if they can avoid the turnovers that obviously completely plagued them last Sunday. Yeah, they, I mean, the Dolphins have zero run game to speak of. They've struggled with that all year long, and they still allowed 92 rushing yards to the to the Dolphins, who haven't been able to figure it out. They're making trades. They're moving around offensive linemen. Uh, the last three games, they've given up 142.3, so they've been slightly better, about five yards better, a little less than five yards better than their season-long average of 147. So the So the matchup is there. It's just okay. Are they I can, can they do it cleanly? I the turnover things with Derek again. I he he got popped on the one that he coughed up that uh, that was in plus territory, and you know you simply can't have it. But it happened. Uh, teams are getting players are getting harder and harder hits on Derek Henry. It feels like, and you know I don't know if that's just something that I'm imagining, but it feels like I'm seeing Derek in the last two seasons get hit harder and more regularly than I can remember. So we can't continue to have the turnover issues. They can't continue to have the turnover issues. The it, miscommunication with Nick Westbrook, Akeen, and Ryan Tannehill, where Tannehill is barking at him on the sidelines because I think he was supposed to sit on the route instead of running through it the way that he did. Those are the kind of things that they got to clean up. Jeff in Smyrna is next. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Buck. Uh, I, I say this uh, reluctantly as a season ticket holder, but I pretty much checked out on this team after week two. And, uh, week two, you know, the, and, they had a six game uh, yeah, winning streak two. in there. Yeah. Oh, and two just left a bad taste in my mouth. And I, I was already looking forward to free agency in the draft. I, I'm, I'm being totally honest with you. And, and, uh, the injuries mounting up week to week, the offensive line play and Todd Downing just, yeah, it just, I mean, it's, it's hard to watch right now. Well, yeah, they're unwatchable, but again, six straight wins. I would think that would have enough juice to kind of, you know, even intrigue you. Yeah, that sounds kind of miserable, right? To, to just not enjoy their season's over in September. What are you, Detroit? Well, even Detroit. Detroit's still alive. I can't even make that joke anymore. Yeah, Detroit's very much alive. What are you, Chicago? That's a terrible one. They're they're wretched again. Well, yeah, and Justin Fields can't stay healthy right now. So, I mean, to check out in week two, though, that that seems dramatic to me. I don't think I don't feel like that's a like when I when I sense apathy, I, that's extreme. Well, now. Week two, you were, you know, yelling about the Titans sold us a false bill of goods. Well, yeah, they did. Yeah, but but I he, my eyes lied to me. There was all kinds of great chemistry between Ryan Tannehill and Austin Hooper, and then there was nothing. It yeah, was gone. The lies then, the training camp told sure. us. And then, you know, ten weeks later they're seven and three after a Thursday night win in Green Bay. Obviously they haven't won since then, but I do think that uh to to check out after week two and not be along for that ride seems a little bit miserable. I certainly didn't check out, I just ripped them. <laughs> Yeah, it's your job not to check out. <laughs> and even then, sometimes in that, buddy, I was gone halfway through that third quarter against Jacksonville. I was so over with that game. I, you know, I figured I'd, if it, there was anything worth of Malik to see that I would watch it later on. But yeah, no, no, thank you. I don't, I know, I know what that experience looks like. Trey is in Nashville next. Hey, Trey. Buddy, how you doing? I'm good. Hey, buddy. 
hey, it's over, bro. It's 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 done. It's been done for a long time. All right. So when, I, when did you first think it was dead? When when did you when did you pronounce them dead? Bro, like last year, like. <laughs> Like, bro, I used my, me and my buddy, we used to watch them every Sunday, and I just, I, I, I can't cry anymore, dude. Everybody has to go. They bring you Ray to Bo- tears, Trey. What, who made you cry? Who hurt you? <laughs> dude, just, our team sucks, bro. It, is this, is this, and the playbook sucks. Like, nobody cares. It's, it's over. Everybody got to go. Everybody got to go. All right, Trey. Very nuanced. <laughs> no middle ground in there? I mean, he already got the GM. So. <laughs> he's like that guy in, a, is it Billy Madison, the dude with the lipstick, the sniper, where he's got the list? Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi, yeah. Steve Buscemi. Got John Robinson, scratches Mike Vrabel's name off the list, or maybe scratches Amy Adams Strunk's name off the list because, you know, she got rid of John for him. <laughs> it's over. Since last year, he says. Oh my God! Are you guys that unhappy? Like I, just, I'm confused because I know you know I'm you know I don't think people necessarily come to me for unbridled optimism or that you come to the show for unbridled optimism. I think we're going to tell you what we see um, and make an accurate assessment and then try and figure out the problem. And you know, as well as bitching about it for three hours because that's kind of what we do. But you know, I dead, <laughs> dead before the season even begins seems seems a bit premature. And if that's the way that you're consuming, well, and ma- listen, maybe that speaks to. I'm, I'm looking at a, I'm looking at a lot of different calls here, and we'll, we'll, I'm sure there will be varying opinions. I don't think uh, the last two are totally representative of our, of our sample size, but the fact that we went two back to back and they're both miserable, I don't know. Does that speak to the style of play? Like he brought up, the playbook sucks. People don't watch them for a reason. They're not exciting, beyond Derek, and that hasn't been a thing for two years. Like, Derek has moments this season. Is that really all it takes to get people to check out beyond the winning record? I, I mean, style points don't matter in the NFL. It's, it's, not, it's not pretty, but it's beautiful, right? The whole, uh, the whole um, oh, who was the right tackle last year? Questenberry, David Questenberry's line. It ain't pretty, but it's beautiful. Steven on YouTube says, we've been unhappy for two and a half years. What are you talking about? What, what is happening They were the right one now? seed last year. I don't, I don't know what to do. I mean... Like I can't, I can't be the ray of sunshine here. Like this, that's not how this dynamic. In fact, the show is specifically set up for me to be the bad guy, and also I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the bad guy. So like, you guys can't, you guys can't be on my corner. I need this corner. You guys got to take another spot. You're supposed to be fighting me on this kind of stuff. What the hell is this, Joey? In Clarksville is next. Hey, Joey. But so, uh, you know, I was with them until the Green Bay game. And then after that, I've kind of died off. Um, I think, you know, they need to go ahead and ax Downey and give the play calling to Tim Kelly. And also, uh, they need to set uh, Tannehill down and let's see what we got in Malik. I know we're paying Tannehill, you know, all this money, but he's just not living up to it, and they need to 86 him. Did you do that on purpose? Yeah, I, I do love, I love that reasoning. I was I was with them right up until they won on Thursday until night their football best at Lambeau Field. Performance of the season, Joey. <laughs> That's when I checked out. What? <laughs> I was with them until they won at Lambeau Field to get to seven and three with a great offensive performance. That's that's at that point I said I'm done. What are we doing here? What are we doing? Like, here? There are a lot of reasons to be upset, but the Titans' performance in Green Bay <laughs> was not one of them. Joey, watch Malik Willis play. That's going to make you happier. That's not a professional NFL quarterback. At this point in time. Like that's arguably their best performance of the season, right? What? Green Houston? Bay? Oh, uh, Green Bay, yeah. Green Bay for sure. No, it is. That's indisputably their best performance <laughs> of the season. It's the, it's the be- oh, my God. oh, my God. I could shower in the Green Bay game. I felt like I had new life. You want to talk about me being pissed about them boring me? I was like, oh, thank God. Traylon Burks, I love you. No, that was it. I checked out. Uh, Done. Done. <laughs> Before the DUI. Not even the DUI set him off. Passing game opened up. Oh you win God. at Lambeau. Prime time. No, that's it. I can't take that. I think you're doing this on purpose. I think you're ordering the calls in terms of the in terms of the worst one. Just so just so I can't get to a just so I can't get to one who's like sick and tired of this stuff. <laughs> Edwin in Nashville is next. What's up? Man, again, 
I'm like, I'm sick and tired of everybody calling in on the bandwagon and throwing gasoline on a burning fire. It's a football team. They're not doing good. But they're the Titans. They're our Titans. It's like hell on a kid. You may not even like what your son doing, but you ain't kicking his ass out the, out the house. <laughs> God, this is football. They having a bad run right now. Do I think they can beat um, L.A.? Yes, I do. I do. Did I think that the Washington was going to beat Philadelphia? No, I didn't, but they did. Philly, Philly had four, three, four turnovers. When you have turnovers, you can't win. But there's no reason for everybody, but that's just the nature of people. They want to jump on the bed. Bad, bad, bad. Why, why, why? I don't watch the Titans until the Titans don't play no more. Go Titans. There he is. I just, he's clearly on a car phone. I just imagine Edwin screaming <laughs> as he drives whatever he's driving down the road. Thank you for the call. You know, I mean, it's sports talk radio, right? Like, people are going to be polarized one way or the other. It's like politics. Like, that's just the nature of this of this thing in particular that people are silly enough to pay us money to do. But I, uh, I... You know the 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 analogy or the the metaphor, whatever whatever the proper term is of of it's not it's like being pissed at your kid. You're not gonna kick. I mean, maybe you disown your kid, but you're not gonna default to disowning your kid and firing everybody that's involved with your kid, right? You're not gonna get, you're not gonna get a divorce because you're pissed. At, well, I don't know. I don't know what the I don't I don't want to dive into your marriage dynamics. We do, we've done enough counseling on this on this show this week. <laughs> Someone listening says, "No, I did. I disowned my child. Yes. I I both disowned my child and div- divorced my significant other." Because, you know, <laughs> I couldn't potty train him or something like that. I don't know. Uh, last call for phone calls. We've got a bunch. We'll get to them. We'll do some polls. Wrap it up on a Friday. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
I like Boogie Shoes as an ending. We can't do Kanye anymore. It's no. super problematic. We had to ditch the, uh, what was it, the Sunday morning? Yeah, ironically, Sunday service. Sunday service, yeah. Yeah, can't, yeah, can't, can't do. You know, try to try to keep the show from being anti, anti-Semitic. Slowly push that one away. Yeah, well, no, not slowly. V- rapidly, rapidly and with great vigor. Like uh, like Reebok when he when he lost his Adidas deal, he walked into Reebok because ever he thought he was people are just gonna buy Yeezys. Coming up next, and they threw him at a Reebok. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I I don't know what to make of the callers. Right, <laughs> like they they it just got super aggressive on a Friday, and I don't know what to do with y'all. I don't know what got into you in the last fifteen minutes of the radio show, but it seems people are losing their minds on both ends of the spectrum, and that's okay. We're here for you. Let's see if we can help produce a little more therapy. Let's go to how about Henry and Dixon next. Yeah, so so here's the thing. I think, yeah, a lot of guys are fired up both sides of this thing. Let me just kind of calm, calm the waters here for a second. So here's the thing. I was at the Jags game, and I watched the disaster happen just like the rest of us. But I honestly think we see the Titans play as well as they did at the Packers game. Once we start getting got a like, ton of lists of guys back, like, uh, David Long Jr., Zach Cunningham, Danico Autry, Traylon Burks, even Jeff getting his ankle back to 100%. You know, once we get those guys back, I think we start seeing that Vrabel magic, which should kick in right at playoff time. Uh, you know, this is a team with grit. And uh, even Tannehill said, you know, great resilience in these guys. I just think we have to have all our guys healthy to get a legit shot at a AFC championship. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the call. So he said, I'm going to come in with balance. And then he said, AFC championship for a game or for a team that again is leaving the league in injuries. I, you know, I mean, it's just it, the, the variable magic. You cease needing as much variable magic. If you have the players, right? Like they, they are a well-coached football team. A lot of people look around the NFL and say the Titans are a well-coached football team. In fact, I think in part, it has helped get the general manager fired because the view of the Tennessee Titans is that they are overachieving with coaching as opposed to the personnel that has been left when you, in reality, the, the personnel is all sitting on in the training room and you're running out there with, respectfully, Nick Westbrook, Aquina, and Cody Hollister. And not even Cody. Cody's on IR. It seems cruelly ironic that John Robinson made such a good hire that it ultimately worked against him in the end. You made two. It was too good. <laughs> <laughs> Reward and competency? No, no, no. It's going to be the thing that kills you at the end. That is some poetic, unfortunate poetic justice if you're John Robinson. Uh, J-Box in Nashville got us next. What up? It was good, child. It was good. Um, honestly, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I record the games while I'm at work. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's like, if they lose, I, I don't watch it. If they win, I, I watch and I'm happy. I mean, I'm optimistic. I mean, to be honest with you, um, we could probably do something, but I kind of gave up after we lost against the Jags. I, I, I haven't seen us lose three straight, and uh, the way we've been playing it, it made me feel like the old days when we were like when we, when we really did suck. Uh, but I mean, everything is up in the air. But uh, I think we can do a little something at least, go to the playoffs, and maybe lose one, but. I hate these other fans we have on the web, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, Facebook pages. They just down, down, down. They look at every, everybody else, and we're not everybody oh, else. Jay, they're they're on the phone lines. They're on the phone. You don't got to go to yeah. Facebook. They're right here. Oh. <laughs> Somebody catch him on the phone at work, and something came up. Who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> I would love that, to hear the door busted through. Who are you talking about? Who is that? What are you doing right now? Aren't you supposed to be on your shift? I have no idea what J-Box does. That's funny. <laughs> All right. One more. We'll see if we can't end up Friday on a high note. Uh, who? All right. Who Who do you think has the best to offer here? Exact, oh, thank you for your help. Just both look around at each other. Robert? He's just giggling. He doesn't have an answer. Go with five, five, he says. Andre and Smyrna. What up? Hey. Listen, let's be real. The Titans are one-dimensional. All they can do is run. They left AB go. 
and it's over. AB, oh, AJ? Uh, Antonio, um, uh, Antonio Brown. They didn't, well, they didn't have Antonio Brown. They let AJ Brown go. Well, not Antonio Brown. Sorry. When did we start calling AJ Brown AB? I've heard that a couple <laughs> times this week. It's okay. It happens. <laughs> yeah, but they let him go. And uh, I mean, we have nothing else left. But Derrick Henry is over. It's a wrap. Okay. Polls. <laughs> <laughs> going to make you an offer you can't refuse because the polls have closed and the votes have been tallied it's time for a poll update and he's a good boy buck rising show producer and correspondent lucas panzica what what the hell just happened that last hour i love it i'm so confused Presented what? by Two Rivers Ford, who sells below MSRP on all non-specialty new Fords. Who gets that last spot off IR for the Titans? We put Molden in there, but it appears as though Molden yeah. done for the year. But Elijah Molden, Kyle Phillips, or David Long, 82% say Long, 14% say Phillips, 4% say Molden. I think you should hope for David Long more than any of the other ones uh, at this point. I just, uh, I, somebody brought up in the uh, in the Zone TV chat, Tony did, the guy who said that he doesn't, wa- he doesn't watch the Titans, he DVRs the Titans games and then, doesn't watch them if they lose. Then he hasn't watched the Titans in a month. <laughs> hasn't seen a Titans game in a month. He's, he's living the best life. Can the Titans beat the Chargers without Danico Autry, who returned to practice again in a limited capacity? I guess Vrabel will tell us in about 15 minutes who will be out on Sunday, but 75% say no, they cannot beat the Chargers without Danico. Brandon Rushing is cursing Roberts as saying five, line five was not the right answer. <laughs> he was giggling as he as he said it. So I think I think Robert knew. Yeah, Antonio Brown, they shouldn't have let him go. A B. Yeah. Uh what's the most interesting bowl game outside of the college football playoffs? Sam Smith says the famous Idaho potato bowl. Not Ashley true. says the only correct answer is the Mayo Bowl. It is Maryland and NC State playing in the mayo bowl uh well i think for you know for the purposes of the sickos around here i think we're all rooting for a particularly disgusting music city bowl i think we want to lean into that as so three to two is an actual college football score that happened between auburn and who auburn and mississippi state i want to say in 2007 that's foul uh tommy tuberville was the head coach at auburn i think maybe uh oh uh it was coach. I'm. I'm. I can't remember matter. who the heck. It does. It does not matter. Way to finish strong. Yeah. Um. Cody says the Rose Bowl, Utah and Penn State. Yeah, that's a good one. Who wins the World Cup final? Argentina or France? Fifty-five percent say Argentina. Forty-five percent say France. Repeat. I was sorry to see Morocco lose. Um. But you know, France obviously the better team at this point. Argentina, and and again, Lucas, I, I can't speak to the strategy of this, and uh, we have we obviously haven't talked a ton of World Cup since the USA got bounced, but like the the Argentinian or, or Argentinian strategy appears to just everybody else run your asses off for the entire game, let Messi kind of like hang back and then make a play when he needs to make a play, and it looks like it's working. Like I don't know, I don't know if that's an actual thing that's happening, but like I know people accusing Messi of kind of like laying back a little bit. And I'm just like, no, they're they're waiting for him. They're giving him yeah. time. He's 35 years old. Like well, he's he's just waiting to be the best possible version of him. And they're letting him like kind of conserve his energy a little bit. He'll do that in the first like 15 minutes of a game where he's kind of just walking or kind of observing as things are happening around him and sort of identifying what's going on. And then he just takes over. It's a, it's been unbelievable to watch. Truly a heavyweight matchup. I can't wait for Sunday morning. Do you think we did good shows this week? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, bud. If we didn't, we're going to have another crack at it Monday morning. We're going to do the show from L.A. Robert's going to be back here at Base Control, and we'll figure it all out between the Titans and the Chargers. Have a fantastic weekend, Blaine, Mickey, myself. We'll talk to you on the Lee Company Countdown to kickoff Sunday afternoon. See you guys.